All right. <clears throat> well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Atlanta City Council meeting. It is Tuesday, December 20, 2021, Pearl Harbor Day, for those of us that are not quite old enough to be experiencing it or remember it, but it, we learned that from a, our history classes. Um, before we call the meeting to order, uh, there's uh, some things that we need to cover from a housekeeping standpoint. Remember that uh, we now are doing meetings on a hybrid format basis, meaning that we're meeting live, but we're also meeting online. And there are folks that will participate with us uh, in the virtual world. They may be uh, tuned in on cable TV or edinamn.gov live meetings or on Facebook. Uh, there's two chances tonight, two opportunities for people to call in and participate in the council meeting. One is during community comment. And then the second one is during the public hearing process. And we've got three public hearings this evening uh, to take care of. And I think on the screen, you're gonna see momentarily the phone number that you wanna be calling in if you're tuning in for the meeting and you wanna address the council on a matter of concern to you in the public comment portion of the agenda, you can do so, but you cannot do it uh, if it involves a matter that's on the otherwise on the agenda this evening or scheduled for a future public hearing. For, so with those two, exceptions, we welcome your call and you can tell us what you're concerned about. Uh, and then also when uh, we have the public hearing matters come in front of us, we'll be using that same conference ID number 800-374, or that same uh, call-in number 800-374-0221 and that conference ID 919-8120, 919-8120. So uh, having provided that information, I'm now going to call the meeting to order and ask for roll call from our clerk, Sharon Ellison. Councilmember Anderson. Here. Councilmember Jackson. Here. Councilmember Pierce. Here. Councilmember Staunton. Here. Mayor Hufflin. Here. Next is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, folks. And now we have uh, the next portion of the agenda is a potential approval of the meeting agenda. Is there anyone on the council or from a staff standpoint that wishes to modify the form of meeting agenda? Hearing nothing, is there a motion to approve the meeting agenda as shown? So moved. Second. Got a motion by Member Staunton, second by Member Anderson to approve the meeting agenda as shown. Any further discussion? All those in favor of adoption of the meeting agenda as published, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Um, before we get to community comment, uh, the last meeting we had, we talked a little bit about some of the escalation that we've been seeing in our community with respect to uh, crime and public safety. And we wanted to do a follow on because we've continued to have some challenges from a public safety standpoint. So Lieutenant Aaron White's with us tonight. Uh, you remember last meeting, the chief reported out on some of the things that we were doing uh, or planning to do. And I think uh, Lieutenant White can talk a little bit about some of the implementation work that we've done uh, at the police department to uh, try to enhance uh, the safety of all of our residents and some of the strategies we may be employing in the near future to help combat this uptick in criminal activity in our community. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us this evening. Thank you. Well, Mayor and Council, uh, thank you. Always appreciate the opportunity to uh, address these issues uh, with you and, and everybody watching. Um, yeah, we, we've obviously been very concerned about the issues we're seeing and uh, that uh, Chief Milburn addressed last time around. I saw that you uh, had an opportunity to see the, um, the, the video production we did with Detective Winandi, who I spoke to a little bit earlier uh, before this meeting, just about those trends and, and everything else. But since that meeting, um, we, we've been doing a number of things. Over the beginning of Thanksgiving, the long weekend, um, that, that began with uh, good old fashioned um, beefing up of resources by putting a number of officers uh, out on the street uh, as an overtime detail over and above our normal Compliment to focus on visible patrol in these neighborhoods uh, to, you know, not only follow up on suspicious activity and vehicles and that sort of thing, but also to try to do some education. We uh, had officers um, 
occasionally checking cars or open garage doors and leaving flyers and that sort of thing. Uh, during the process of that, we actually we, we deterred some crime. We ran into a few of uh, suspicious circumstances and, di and different things. I, I myself came in for a couple hours on Thanksgiving, and I'm a little rusty and out of practice, but I got in a squad car and, and uh, happened upon one of those. Uh, some folks up to no good in the city, and um, you know, took me a little while to write the tickets and all that kind of stuff, but uh, we're all doing our part. It's incredibly important to us. Uh, we're redirecting our uh, patrol resources whenever possible to focus on where the trends are and trying to analyze data as fast as we can. So we're, we're, we're fully dedicated from top to bottom to this issue. The, uh, I'd, I'd be remiss to not then also say that we continue to uh, really need the community to help us out. And um, we've been communicating a lot, right? Social media and, and uh, press releases and, and videos and stuff. And I'll be honest, occasionally, you know, you know how social media is, right? You get the comments and the pushback. Occasionally, some of that isn't isn't very positive. Some of it, you know, it's, it, I, th I think some folks might read some of those crime prevention tips as us saying, "Hey, do our work for you." And uh, I couldn't be more clear in saying that's not the case. But it's the foundation of this problem. Um, folks are coming into our neighborhoods knowing that if they check enough doors, they're going to find an open one. It doesn't take any sound or any force to open an unlocked door. And with modern cars with the push buttons and the ability, I do it myself on occasion, to leave those fobs behind, while you're there looking for valuables, all you got to do is press that start button. And we know for a fact, based on the trends we've seen, that that's what's happening. Check an open door, see if there's any valuables, and while you're there, you hit that start button. And if that car starts, that's the next stolen car. And as Detective Winandi spoke about in his video, that car could then go on to commit additional crimes and he died in other places. So we're very much in tune with it. We're working really hard on it. We're going to continue in the coming weekends to um, put those overtime details on the street. Uh, we're going to continue to analyze the data. Uh, but we're, we're, we're almost going to go from politely asking to begging folks to really think hard about those basic um, steps to lock, lock those doors, lock those cars, uh, and those key fobs, I tell you, I think just about everybody's got a push button to start. You can probably imagine a guy that dresses like this for work is kind of proactive with crime prevention. And I've done it. You know, you come out of the gym or the grocery store or something, and there it is in your center council. And you go, gosh, that'd be embarrassing if my car got stolen. So um, we all do it. But the cars that are being stolen in Edina um, almost universally have a, a key fob in them. So um, that's our ask, and we'll keep doing what we're doing. So. All right, thank you. Lieutenant White, uh, Member Sutton. Yeah, thanks for that update. I wanted to chime in and say that it seems like we're getting some good feedback from residents. There was one email today in particular by a woman who lives over, I think, in the Country Club neighborhood, and she was asking to partner with the department and try to get out to folks, and I know Chief Milburn had gotten back to her so I'm really pleased to see that kind of response so that, you know, I think, I think folks in the community are, are hearing what you're saying and they want to work together to make this happen. So anything the department can be doing to be responsive to that, I think, is really important. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up. And we will um, absolutely, I, I believe that particular interaction, um, that um, person was looking at setting up a community meeting or a neighborhood meeting and had um, mentioned that to us. And, and I... I I think I can speak for uh, Chief Milburn and all of us in saying we're absolutely willing to be engaged in that and um, be present at that or other meetings or um, you know do some crime prevention talks. Much like you've opened this door here tonight, if, if you give me or a number of others in our department an opportunity, we're more than happy to, um, to tell our story and to, uh, to share that message because uh, we got a lot of good things going on and we're uh, more than happy to, to enlist the public to help. So. Yeah, and I think they're anxious to help, so. Yes, thank you. Yep. And I think as you continue this, this trend towards more community policing, uh, and you start building more community trust, which is at a high level already, uh, that greater and greater trust element, uh, it can only pay big dividends for our entire community. And uh, this morning, incidentally, at Rotary, you got a, you got a compliment from one of our fellow Rotarians who uh, at 1.30 in the morning, she said uh, the doorbell rang. Uh, she kind of reluctantly went down to answer the door, and it was one of your officers, one of our officers, 
telling her that her garage door was open. And she had left it open, or her daughter had left it open when she went somewhere, and maybe they were waiting for her to come back home, but the garage door was clearly open, and so she thanked them and closed the garage door. And uh, it was nice to know that our officers are, are, are helping our residents in that way. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, next, we're going to go to a community comment. Let's put that number back up on the screen again. Uh, here it is. If anybody wants to call in and, and address the council on a matter of concern to them uh, that's not otherwise on the agenda this evening or scheduled for a future public hearing, we're going to let you call in. But we're first going to ask if anyone in the audience is here for community comment and ask them to come forward if they are. And we'll uh, listen to those folks first, but uh, the others that are in the virtual world, why don't you call in now and get in the queue and then Director Benerod will bring you in to speak to the council in just a few minutes. Anyone who wishes to address the council on a matter of concern to them? Yes, sir, come on up. And give us your name and address, please. Uh, Russell Fistram, 5250 Grandview Square, uh, uh, Unit 2103. Uh, my question has to do with the tax levy. Is this the appropriate time to talk about that? Um, no, there's going to be a public hearing later on on the tax levy, on the proposed tax Today. levy. So you want, want to hold on for that. Thank you. Thanks for asking that predicate question. Anyone else in the audience wish to address the council on a matter of concern to them that's not on the agenda tonight or scheduled for a future public hearing? Okay. Let's go to the uh, virtual world and see if anybody has called in to speak to the council. We do have one speaker ready to go. Operator, will you please unmute the line of Mr. David Frankel? David, please begin by stating your full name and address for the record. David Frankel, 4510 Lakeview Drive, Edina. Yesterday I sent an email to the uh, MnDOT Twin Cities Regional Office. And my question to them would, was, would it be possible to find out if the two pedestrian bridges over Highway 100 between Benton Avenue and Eden Avenue in Edina are ADA, which is Americans with Disability Act compliant? The response from the MnDOT office is as follows. I've been told both bridges are not compliant. Bridge 9896 between Kent and Windsor Avenue has excessive running grades on the bridge deck and the approach ramps. Bridge 9895 has excessive running grades on the bridge deck. What surprises me with the memorandum of understanding that the city and MnDOT signed a couple of years ago to quote unquote connect the east and west side of Edina did not include any reference to the two non-compliant bridges. There's been a lot of talk about reconnecting Edina, including the non-compliant ADA bridge over Crosstown or Highway 62. Edina has three non-compliant ADA bridges, and there's very little activity to get this corrected. MnDOT has told me within five years they will hopefully plan on finding funding to upgrade all non-compliant pedestrian bridges in Minnesota. So we'll see what happens with that. But I think as far as anything moving forward, these bridges should be part of the reconnecting Edina discussion, which unfortunately the ADA, these bridges have been non-compliant since ADA was passed in 1990. These bridges have been out of compliance for 31 years. And as we commemorate the life of Senator Bob Dole this week, he was actually the major pusher of ADA through the U.S. Senate. And it's unfortunate we live in a community now that has three major structures that are not ADA compliant. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frankel. I Anyone have no else? one else on the line right now. All right, very good. Uh, what we generally do following uh, community comment uh, is that we ask our city manager to respond to any comments that were made by the community the prior meeting. So two weeks ago, we may have had some uh, comments that uh, the city manager will be responding to. And I'm going to turn to Scott Neal now and ask him if he has any uh, responsive comments to any community comments that were made at the last meeting. 
Thank you, Your Honor, I do. Uh, we had a, a really robust number of, of folks who spoke to the council uh, at the November uh, 16th council meeting. Um, we had four different speakers uh, who expressed su uh, support and, and encouraged the council, council to support the climate action plan. The climate action plan was not on that agenda, it's on this agenda tonight. So we had four speakers that were expressly here for that. Uh, we had a resident who was here uh, who had some ideas about how we could, uh, alternative ideas about how we could work with the Edina Theater as opposed to how we're proceeding to work with the Edina Theater, which is that uh, the Edina Theater is a, is a privately owned theater. We are operating uh, under that principle going forward uh, and assisting them uh, with, with re-engaging that theater in, into regular public use. Uh, we had uh, a, sp a person who spoke about concerns about construction at uh, Valley View and Wooddale. We've had persistent concerns about, about that as well and whether or not that project is in compliance with general city uh, building safety and planning uh, standards. And, and, and generally it is. Uh, when they've had, they've had issues uh, with us where they have stored materials on site that we didn't want them to or or operated, got going earlier and stayed later perhaps, but when we had had complaints, we have addressed them. Um, so that, uh, those are some concerns that we have taken into consideration. Uh, some concerns about expressed about crime in Edina, um, and we had addressed those earlier that night, and uh, I think that was it. That was it. Good. Thank you, Manager Neal. That prompt any basis for inquiry from any of our council members? Okay, good, thanks. All right, we'll move on to the next portion of the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to remove an item from the consent agenda? Member Staunton? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to remove item 6D as in dog and 6L as in Larry. All right, does anyone else wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? All right, with the exception of uh, Roman 6D and L, is there a motion to approve the balance of the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Got a motion by Member Staunton and second by Member Jackson to approve the consent agenda with the exclusion of items 6D and L. Any further discussion? All those in favor of passage of the motion as stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And now, Member Staunton, back to 6D, which deals with a potential ordinance amendment setting, and that sets fees for 2022 in a variety of different areas. Member thank, Staunton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the issue that I wanted to raise here is um, one of the items that was called out in the, in the kind of cover memo is some increases in the recycling fees and the composting fees. And I'm not opposed to those per se, but what I wanted to talk about a little bit is how we might be able to think in the future about how we can better align the incentives we're trying to create for waste disposal with the costs. So we were having a little conversation, I know the mayor and I on the way down the stairs about the composting and how, how now that he's been doing it for a while, he's feeling like it would be awkward not to have it, but I think we can get people to, we ought to make it cheaper to compost and cheaper to recycle and more expensive to do traditional trash. And I don't know the best way to do that. I don't know if that's gonna segue with our eventual conversation about organized hauling, but I'd like to see us do some thinking about how we can put the financial incentives aligned with what we're trying to accomplish in terms of waste reduction. So I don't, I don't have any particular okay. suggestion on that, but I would like to get staff's brains I thinking on that. Okay. Very good. Any other council comments on that matter? Member Stanton, would you care then to move uh, oh, forward? Member Jackson? I'm just, no, I'm just nodding. Thank you for bringing, bringing that up. It's a great idea. Manager Neal. Yeah, and, and I talked to uh, Council Member Staunton about this earlier this morning as well. You know, at the moment, at the moment, we only re control uh, one of those uh, revenue streams, and that's the revenue stream uh, around re recycling and, and organics collection. 
uh, as we discuss uh, how or how organized hauling might impact us, that potentially could put us into a role where we could have a greater influence over over cost and therefore begin to, to use that as leverage uh, to uh, make one one side of that equation cost more than the other side. Um, so, and you certainly see us doing it, for instance, with water consumption. Exactly. We have volume exactly. based and we should be you know, people who are going to use the the normal traditional waste stream should pay more for that right. than people who are going to make the effort to compost and recycle. But I, but I think your anticipation that this question is going to be uh, more applicable to us in the future as you begin to talk about organized hauling is, is the right way to think about it. It might not be uh, initially in that system, but as that system matures, uh, we're seeing other cities that have that have. Uh, have made some similar kinds of moves in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. With that, Sean, would you move that matter? I would. I'd make that motion, Your Honor. Is there a second? Second. All right, Member Staunton moves and Member Pierce seconds the adoption of Ordinance 2021-16, which would amend Chapter 2 of the City Code and set fees in a variety of different areas for 2022. Any further discussion on that matter? All those in favor of adoption of the motion of state to say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And then the other matter, Member Staunton was, uh, 6L was the request for purchase public safety software from Tyler Technologies. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I did want to raise on this issue, given the discussions we've been having about law enforcement and how we're working smarter and, and using data, et cetera. And I know Aaron White is here this evening and he's the one who's been working on this conveniently enough. I wanted to ask a little bit about what this will do for us. We've been having a lot of discussions about budgetary items and and it's one thing to talk about the features, but I'd like to understand the benefits a little more and, and how this can help us be more effective in law enforcement. Absolutely, happy to talk about that. I've This is a project, as you mentioned, near and dear to my heart. It's been about 24 months of uh, research analysis and on again off again work towards today um, and so I feel pretty well versed in it but uh, one of the big ones um, is the evolution of software really we've been using our current software for 15 years uh, originally forecast to maybe be good for 10 at the most and uh, you know in in the interest of um, being good stewards of the dollars, we've we've been able to get a lot more life out of that. Nonetheless, everybody, I think, in this room and beyond, recognizes how much software evolves and technology evolves. Prior to 15 years ago, a police report was written in a, a Word template, put in a manila envelope, and filed on a certain shelf. And so a police department collected an enormous amount of data and uh, stored that data but really had no way of analyzing that data. Really, you know, you really had to dig deep to understand trends and that sort of thing. It was a huge step forward to move to the software we utilize today uh, and, and allowed us to better access that data, but not really in real time, not really in a way that allowed us to say, compare um, police reports to calls for service in the computer aided dispatch system. So that takes us to this next generation software, one of the biggest benefits of which is the real-time accessibility of that data. We collect an enormous amount of it and, um, and the analytics capability of this next generation software is uh, tremendous. So that's one of the huge benefits. Um, and then secondarily is just advancements in mobility. Uh, right now police officers have a big cumbersome laptop computer in their squads and uh, they still get out of the car with a notebook and they take notes, maybe they record a statement on a recorder, and uh, then maybe at the end of the call they can start putting that into the system, uh, or maybe they get busy and they have to wait till the end of the shift. The next uh, generation software allows us the same mobility that allows us to be nuisanced by email and text messages all day and that the officer can walk out of the squad car uh, carrying a phone and have all that functionality with them to capture data, to capture pictures, not forget to download them later, but have them already attached to a case file to be able to collect information um, from a reporting party or the people involved in an event in real time. And again, that feeds into that analysis uh, advantage that um, we look forward to leveraging. And I assume, you know, to use the example of the car thefts we were talking about earlier this evening, this is gonna give us an even better idea of 
any patterns that might exist from data that we're collecting so that we can adjust patrol kind of routes or or anticipate where the next kind of criminal activity might be happening. That's right. Um, we've invested a lot over the last couple of years in crime analysis, right? Looking at better ways to use that data. And one of the limitations of our current crime analyst is the amount of just sheer time it takes to collect that data. You might have a particular question and it might be sourced out of three databases. And then a person has to sit down with Excel or a calculator and actually come up with those percentages, like how much did that change, right? So when we have an issue like auto thefts, we can target that individual at that and get a little bit more current information. But what we hope to do is be able to use technology to get real-time information. In other words, rather than 15 days into the following month coming up with a statistical analysis of what happened and where, I'd like to be able to look at that the next morning. Yeah. Uh, and likewise, to be able to show the public some more of that data. Um, we currently have a crime map, you know, it's probably a few years behind in technology, but it, it doesn't share a lot of information. It's kind of hard to decode. This will allow us to really enhance that public facing um, data situation as well, where you might be able to wake up in the morning and hear about, uh, hey, something happened in my neighborhood and, and immediately be able to get some insight about what, what took place. So from that level all the way up to cr crime analysis to directing patrols, everything else um, gives you a lot better real-time data access. Well, thanks for that explanation. I, I, Mr. Mayor, I just really wanted to kind of raise this up as an example of the fact that I know this is going to evolve. It's going to take time to get this in place, but it's a great example of how our department is kind of working all the time to try and improve our abilities to, mm -hmm. to do this right. So thanks for your work on that, and I would move this uh, matter, Your Honor. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Or we got a motion second by Member Stoughton to approve the request for purchase of the new public safety soft software from Tyler Technologies. Any further discussion? All, the, all those in favor of uh, adopting the request or approving the request for purchase say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Very good. Yeah, I was uh, stunned when I realized that the uh, existing public safety software system technology you were using was 15 years old. So. I guess on the one hand, I thank you for that fiscal responsibility, but on the other hand, we want to make sure that you're up to date. And it was nice to get an explanation via Member Staunton of uh, what these new capabilities will mean for 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 your, you as a police officer in a police department, but also for our residents. So thank you. All right. Uh, that concludes the uh, consent agenda matters. And now we're going to move on to special recognitions and presentations. And uh, Michael Epstein, our chair of our Human Rights and Relations Commission, is here to do something that we've been doing annually for many, many years, and he'll talk about that. And it's something called the Tom Oy Award. And uh, the uh, Human Rights and Relations Commission, some of the members and Chair Epstein are here to announce the Tom Oy Award winner for 2021. Chair Epstein, please come forward. Thanks for being with us this evening. So, uh, as the mayor said, I'm here to um, announce the award for the Tom Oy, and this annual award is given by the Dinah Human Rights and Relations Commission, which I have the honor of chairing. This award pays tribute to the late Tom Oy and other members of the Edina community whose good works promote human relations and advance human rights. Nominees were evaluated based on their efforts to foster respect and dignity for others, model courage and or compassion in the advancement of human rights, and demonstrate leadership by example for improving human relations or advancing human rights. Edina's Human Rights Award was established in recognition of the late Tomoy, a second generation Japanese American who served as a Nisei soldier in World War II in the 100th Infantry Battalion of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. In 2003, Oi received the prize for humanity by the Immortal Chaplains Foundation. The first time Oi Human Rights Award was presented in April 2006 to Mary Ellingen, a women's rights activist. Since the inception of the yearly award, the Human Rights and Relations Commission has been able to discover many accomplishments in the community 
that promote human rights and relations in Edina. This year, I am thrilled to recognize Sali Amara Perkar and Asha USA as our winner. We had a number of excellent submissions, and it's always difficult to choose a winner. This year was one of the hardest. Um, I'm going to quote from the, the submission that we got from Siley's nominator. Siley has been a resident of Edina for 20 years. She created a nonprofit organization called ASHA USA to help end the stigma of mental illness in the South Asian community. Now the organization also helps recent immigrants adapt to life in the United States. They also have a seniors group and plan activities for them. In the last year, Siley and Asha USA have started race talks for all ages to encourage the South Asian community to think about systemic racism and how they can help make the world a better place. Siley is also a member of the board of the Indian Association of Minnesota, and she also started a new event this October called Pink Garba, a breast cancer awareness event and fundraiser. The event was also had a Garba dance where people in attendance wore pink to raise awareness for cancer. She also works as the South Asian cultural liaison for, Adina, for the Edina Public Schools. She helps teachers learn about the many Indian subcontinent cultures and traditions. She also helps parents navigate the school system. With Asha USA, she has a monthly YouTube channel, discussions with the theme of breaking the stigma. Topics have been about autism and early intervention, domestic violence, and more. In addition to this, she's also started a podcast that's in Hindi about parenting. Philanthropy and charity work are also in her blood, and every part of her is dedicated to community service, equality, and love of fellow human beings. So having seen that nomination, it, it should be obvious to everybody why we felt that she was more than qualified to earn this year's Tom Oye Award, and it is my honor to present it to her. You know, I'm really humbled and honored to be chosen for this year's Tom Oy Award. And I want to thank the Human Rights and Relations Committee for considering me. And I want to thank Firoza Mehta, who nominated me, and she's here today. Uh, and what he just read, it is really heartwarming to see that the work that I've been doing uh, out of my own passion, interests, and uh, efforts got noticed. And uh, so this is uh, uh, really an affirmation for the work. And um, uh, he already described the work that I do through ASHA USA and other organizations. And um, uh, 
Actually, I have been with Asha USA since its founding by Kamala Puram, who was another Idaina resident uh, in 2014. And she gave me full freedom and entrusted me with the vision uh, that is Asha USA. And we work with South Asian immigrant families, so families who are originally from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Tibet, uh, and some families from Guyana as well. And we have uh, uh, quite a, a sizable population here in Edina as well. And um, he's already described everything. I can. I just want to say that, <laughs> uh, you know, um, the, thank you so much. And I want to thank Kamala Puram for, as I said, for giving me the freedom to do the work that I, as I want to do it. And I'm ever grateful to my parents who inculcated a sense of giving back to the society in me and my sisters. And my husband, Bal, who is also here, who has always been a support of pillar uh, a pillar of support and uh, encouraging me to pursue my dreams. Uh, I'm happy that both our kids, Om and Atman, have also imbibed this spirit of uh, service work and are giving back to the community in whatever way they can. And again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is just the beginning. There's a lot of work to be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Atman, would you stand up, please, so people can see who you are? So Atman, Atman is one of our, uh, our National Merit Scholars, one of the 31 from Edina. And uh, he and his brother, uh, when Atman, I think, was just an eighth grader, started a um, nonprofit. And uh, I don't know if you want to come up and tell folks about that nonprofit that you created. We had a great conversation. Uh, now he's a senior, of course, as a merit scholar, and tell us a little bit about it so folks in our community can know what you and your brother did. I think he was a sophomore at the time. Right. So I was in seventh grade when we founded OmniSite International after a trip to India really elucidated the issues with eyesight that youth in underprivileged schools are constantly experiencing, seriously affecting education, can't read the blackboard, play sports, etc. So what we did is, you know, we used our spare glasses and um, gave eye care to children in just a local school. And soon we expanded that into OmniSite International, thanks to, um, you know, Edina, thanks to Dick Crockett, and just using our resources here to give eye care in schools in India in orphanages in Tanzania, Ilula, and now we recently expanded to Ghana. So that's where the mission is right now. Thank you, Atman. Thank you. So in visiting with Atman, he hopes to follow his older brother, Om, who's, uh, say Ali mentioned, uh, he's at Stanford, and that's uh, Atman's uh, hopeful destination as well. You can tell he's one of a one of the young people can, we can really be proud of in Edina. He's a wonderful young man. Thank you for all that, all that you're doing. It's really a, a tremendous thing to see. You're making all of us hearken back to what we were doing as high, seniors in high school. <laughs> so, and it wasn't forming a nonprofit. So, Mr. Mayor, yes. um, I just want to thank the Human Rights Commission because we didn't know who the winner was. So it was kind of like the Academy Awards tonight. And it, it, you did not fail yeah, to, that's to, a great point. to make us all thrilled. So thank you. Yeah, I, when I saw the family there, I thought they were here for the uh, Climate Action Plan. And I thought, well, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so, all right, thanks. Good, good comments. All right, we've got one more item on this portion of the agenda, and we've got uh, Annie Coyle with us, who's our consultant. I'm going to turn it over to Scott Neal first, but uh, Annie Coyle used to work here uh, uh, for uh, maybe at least one full year uh, as an intern, possibly longer. I can't remember. Manager Neal will tell us all about her and uh, the work that she's been doing on behalf of the city with regard to the American Rescue Plan funds that we received. Thank you. Manager Neal. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> I want to introduce uh, Annie Coyle. Uh, as the mayor uh, noted, Annie uh, was our second uh, Dyna City Management Fellow back in, I don't know, 14 or 15, somewhere back there. And um, 
when we needed someone who to to help us actually pull all of this together, right? All of the priorities that the council had in terms of getting this money into the community, I, I went looking for someone who could take this on and it would be their, their main thing, right? And um, not just among many main things. And I had a quick conversation with Annie. She was interested in doing that for us. And so she has been really uh, uh, coordinating all of this behind the scenes process to, to get this money out into the community to, to do good. So uh, I asked Annie if she would be uh, uh, available to come to the council tonight and to give a, a brief presentation to just let you know the status of the various pieces of this. And uh, she's here tonight to do that. So Annie Coyle. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Coyle. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. So as Manager Neal explained, I'm just going to be giving you a brief update about where we're at with the round one implementation and also looking forward. So as you might remember, the city of Edina has been allocated just shy of $5 million for ARPA funds. Um, half of that money has already been received and the second half is expected mid-year next year. So back in September, the council reviewed the round one implementation plan and there are a number of buckets that um, the city is allocating funds into. So we're working individually on all those program areas trying to get the dollars out the door. You might remember some of the big picture visions that we had as part of that implementation plan to date. The first is that the city wants to serve populations most impacted by the pandemic. And of course, use a race and equity lens to do that. So in addition, the city intends to have both short-term and long-term impacts with this funding so that we can address immediate needs but also look into the future. And of course, focus the majority of the funding externally outside the city body to directly benefit the community. Of the 2021 funding areas, we put them into four buckets. You, you could kind of see where the dollars are going. First is direct assistance to people. So that's food assistance, rent assistant, assistance, internet, and mental health. And that, that comes to about 50% of the dollars. The second area is direct assistance to business, which comprises 23%, and that also includes support for nonprofits. The third is the internal looking improvements to city facilities and technology. That's also at 23%. And the final 4% is the direct COVID-19 mitigation, which ties directly into those long-term climate change mitigation efforts. The implementation to date. So you have already seen agreements with the Edina Education Fund for school-based mental health support. There have been agreements in place for Hennepin County to increase social worker hours through the police department for crisis intervention work, and also to get updated public health software and essential function. As you already know, on tonight's agenda, we have the Comcast Internet Essentials Program, which intends to provide free internet for the next year for eligible households. In addition, there is an agreement for direct support for the Edina Chamber of Commerce, as well as an agreement for direct support for the 50th and France Business and Professional Association. Looking forward, we have a couple of different buckets I'm gonna to touch on. We've been working hard to establish a technical assistance program or TAP program for small businesses to respond to the pandemic changes and the needs for small businesses in this community. And we hope to see that launch in early 2022. We also have business support for Edina Theater to anticipate and support the reopening efforts that are already rolling. Related to food community support, we have rental and food assistance through VEEP. We're finalizing that program, we're getting the contracts in place, and we expect to have something before you in January for your review and approval. In addition, the Next Gen Tree Program, which is the planting of a thousand new trees in Edina next year, is fully underway. So that's looking at the types of trees, the specific locations, and finalizing logistics of actually getting a thousand trees in the ground next year during planting season. The final category is the city investment. So putting in broadband connections to city utility facilities, sewer and water during the 2022 construction season to protect um, our infrastructure, both to get it upgraded and to ensure for cybersecurity reasons that we are ready to go. 
we were asked, or I was asked by city staff to look at comparisons. We all know that these ARPA dollars are national dollars that were spread all over the country. So we can see a wide variety of the directions of different communities and where they went with the money. There are many communities that haven't even started the discussions yet. There's also different rules based on funding amounts and population sizes. And so that directly impacts what communities are doing with their dollars. But the federal government wanted these dollars to respond to very specific local needs that are identified by the local community. So that's why we see such a wide variety of responses. Locally, we engaged with 11 comparable cities here in the metro area. And what we find out, found out was quite interesting. A majority of peer cities are actually going the route of revenue replacement, which is um, accounting for dollars that were lost during the pandemic. And then those ARBA funds are just being deposited into the general fund for those cities. The second most common project area for comp cities was water and sewer infrastructure projects. The third, some cities are spending the dollars on COVID mitigation that might be related to texting, vaccine mandates, some equipment purchases, et cetera. But generally speaking, there were very few other projects that cities have either announced or are considering. And that was quite a different approach. One thing that I was specifically listening for is if any comp cities were engaging with their school districts. And the answer was no. Here, we're engaging directly. We're doing the mental health initiatives. Um, the city engaged early on to find out what are the community needs? What does the school district know? So that was something really unique and that I wanted to bring up to you. So looking forward, of course, we have federal reporting to do um, related to the funds. Uh, the federal government has three times revised reporting requirement deadlines, but now annually there will be reporting due every year in April. Of course, there's gonna be additional ongoing tracking of progress and the impacts of each program. So we know here at the city level where the dollars are going intrinsically, what the impacts are, and those longer term impacts that are gonna go beyond just the um, brief federal requirements of reporting. There's still a big piece that I wanted to bring up, which is the second half of those dollars that have yet to be allocated by council. There are internal city discussions planned for January of next year to start that conversation. It's been nine months since ARPA was enacted back in March. A lot of things have happened, a lot of things have changed, and a lot of work has been done. So the staff is gonna have internal conversations about what they've learned, what they see as immediate needs, and what they see as future needs. And we wanted to bring that up because approximately in March, we're hoping to have a recommendation up to council about round two. So with that, I would be happy to answer any questions and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Coyle, for that uh, succinct and uh, excellent presentation. Uh, questions from council members for Ms. Coyle? Uh, council member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so when we looked at comparable communities, we have some cities that we look at nationwide as comparable communities. Did you include those in your analysis? Great question, I did not. No, I looked generally when I looked for just national information and it was a little bit ago. So the, the more direct comps were um, recent and very local. Okay, thank you. So going forward, if, if that information is easily available, I'd be interested to see what sure. they're doing. That's a great idea, thank okay. you. Thank you. You know, the only thing I the only thing I would add is that in in one of Annie's slides there was the words revenue replacement. I think it's important for you to know what that is. Revenue replacement means we would just take this five million bucks, we'd put it in the bank, and we would say we had five million dollars of extra police and fire costs. And at the end of the year, we'd have five million dollars more than what we did when what we were expecting. That's not what we did. We did this the hard way, right? We, most of our peers are just keeping the money and, and, and using it as revenue replacement. We are taking the money and putting it out into the community where it can do more good than just in our bank account. So yeah. I think it's important for you to know that it's different than what, you know, some of your peer cities are doing and uh, that's why. Yeah, I think it's something we talked about in the past that was getting the best bang for the buck out of yeah. this money to help uh, in, in positive ways. So thank you, Ms. Coyle. Thanks for being with us this evening and we'll look forward to seeing you again. All right, we're gonna move on now to the uh, public hearing portion of the agenda. We've got three public hearing matters in front of us this evening. And the first one, uh, Chad Milner, our Director of Engineering has, and this is a presentation on the proposed final layout for project one of the I-494 Vision Implementation Plan 
We were going to have our uh, West Area engineer with us, uh, Andrew Lutaya from MnDOT, but he's unavailable this evening due to something that came up. Uh, we do have Amber Blanchard from MnDOT, who is the MnDOT project manager, available virtually. And uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Director Milner to, um, to make the presentation on this matter. Uh, what we're going to propose on this particular matter is that we keep the public hearing open until noon on December 13th, and then we continue it to action on the uh, on the 21st of December at that particular city council meeting. So, Director Milner, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor, members of council. I think you did a great job introducing it. I'll just hand it over to Amber. I'm going to run the slides. She has six slides, and, and there's one video. That's about four minutes that explains the project. So, I guess I'll kick it over to Amber first if she has any opening remarks before the video. Right, Thanks, Chad. Thanks, Director Miller. Uh, Mem uh, Ms. Blanchard, welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for having me today. I uh, hope you are all doing well. I uh, just wanted to say that I'm happy to be here, and uh, I'm just going to talk briefly about the 494 Project 1 layout. And uh, Chad, why don't you go ahead and play the video? Okay. We're going to wait for a communications person. There might be a slight technical thing. We're not seeing the slide, so we'll, we'll give Jennifer for one minute here. Bear with us, Ms. Blanchard. We'll be with you momentarily. Okay, in order to do this, when we show the slides, we won't see Amber. Um, typically, the remote presenter presents his or her own slides. Because of this, sure. we just don't have that capability set up. So I'm gonna cut away from Am Amber. Amber, I hope you can still narrate this, the slides in the video. Then we'll come back to Amber. We'll do the video first. This project began in the spring of 2018 and had three phases of screening. Phase one was the initial screening that narrowed down many alternatives into a few. Phase two selected the apparent preferred alternative. And phase three, where we are today, is the environmental review of the preferred alternative. The environmental document is anticipated to be completed in summer 22. Design and construction are anticipated to start in 2023 for the first construction project. Development of the I-494 vision was completed last year for the entire freeway, all the way from the Minneapolis-St. Paul Airport to Highway 169. This was to determine the solutions to address corridor needs and begin the environmental review process. The proposed vision will improve the capacity of the interstate and improve the reliability of the average rush hour trip. The project is divided into three key areas. The first, is the I-494 main line. To best address current and future conditions for I-494, easy pass lanes were selected because they provided the best opportunity to address current needs. An easy pass lane in each direction will add capacity from Highway 169 to Highway 77. Easy pass lanes could be used by all users during most hours of the day and by buses and vehicles with two or more occupants during peak rush hour. The second area is the I-35W and I-494 interchange. A turbine interchange with a ramp was recommended as the option that best addresses the goals of the study, including improved traffic operations and safety on both I-35W and I-494. The new ramp in the northeast corner of the interchange would allow traffic, traffic heading northbound I-35W to westbound I-494 to flow more efficiently. The third key area is the changes to highway access at Nicolet Avenue, Portland Avenue, and 12th Avenue. Existing entrance and exit ramps at Lindale, Nicolet, Portland, and 12th Avenue are too close, which causes congestion and safety issues on I-494. The public made it clear that the proximity of entrance and exit ramps was a major safety and traffic concern. So to reduce congestion and improve safety on I-494, MnDOT will close all ramps at Nicollet Avenue and 12th Avenue, as well as create a full access interchange at Portland Avenue with two on and two off ramps. These improvements will provide adequate space for vehicles to safely enter and exit the interstate, while also upgrading all three bridges to better serve local pedestrians, bicyclists, and drivers. In addition, a new pedestrian bridge will be built between Portland and 12th Avenue, near Chicago Avenue. 
This will provide another option for pedestrians and bicyclists crossing I-494. The I-494 vision cannot be built all at once due to funding limitations and impacts during construction. The vision has been broken into nine elements as shown in the diagram shared here. The project partners prioritize elements of the vision based on many factors. These factors reflect the concerns heard from the public at the beginning of this process. Factors included the following. Constructability evaluated how each element will operate with other elements being constructed at the same time. Community support to consider the top transportation priorities and needs for the local communities based on public feedback. Equity considered the fair distribution of transportation options and investments for underrepresented communities. Asset management considered the life cycle of the infrastructure and the need for maintenance or replacement. Cost and funding considered the cost of each individual element and the available funding. Operations and safety evaluated how each element will impact the existing network and whether it improves current conditions for traffic congestion and safety. Okay, Amber, can you see the next slide? I right. can. Okay. Thanks, Chad. All right. Uh, the reason we're here today is to uh, look at municipal consent. Uh, municipal consent is uh, in state law in section 161, and it does provide an opportunity for municipalities to really comment and approve on the uh, project layout. And so the reason we're here in Edina is to is because of the addition of the easy, plat, easy pass lanes. Uh, typically, we don't actually need to go out and get municipal consent for those uh, managed lanes, but uh, we have been doing that uh, on all of our easy pass and formerly min pass lanes to date. Next slide, please, Chad. We've held a lot of engagement opportunities for stakeholders throughout uh, Edina, Eden Prairie, Richfield, and Bloomington. And we've had virtual open houses as well. We have a 494openhouse.com website as our virtual open house. And we've had uh, public open houses, including uh, in Richfield and Bloomington uh, on site uh, this fall. And since September, uh, between actually September and October, we've received 2,200 visitors to our uh, virtual open house, which is great. And we received a lot of um, a lot of uh, traffic from the stakeholders as well in previous efforts uh, earlier this spring too. Next slide, please, Chad. So our next steps, uh, we are doing ongoing outreach. We actually have some outreach coming up uh, for the visual quality manual that we are uh, completing here through from now until March. So there'll be opportunities for those. And uh, we are on track for construction starting in the summer of 2023. Our first project, uh, project costs uh, do include uh, construction at 320 million. And then you also see uh, dollar amounts for right of way, utilities, uh, as well as um, other change, order, change orders through construction when that uh, takes place, that's uh, kind of a placeholder. So there's, there's other things that go into our uh, total project cost there of 417 million. And I'm sure many of you are aware that we also do have funding sources from our quarters of commerce, state bonds, uh, local, state and federal funds as well will be used. And we did receive a $60 million infra grant federal award uh, back in the summer as well that will be included and used on this first project. So I believe that is probably one of my last slides. Uh, here is the project website on MnDOT site as well as the online open house that I had mentioned previously. So uh, that concludes my presentation, Mr. Mayor and council members, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Blanchard. Does anyone on the council have questions for Ms. Blanchard? This point in time. Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I don't know if this is for Chad or for you, Ms. Planter or Director Milner. Um, I'm very concerned when I read through this about um, cut through traffic. 
Um, I think, you know, the MnDOT anticipates that people will take 62 as an alternative route. Well, we know that 62 is already highly congested and that they're going down 66th Street and 70th Street. And um, I would like to know, well, so first of all, I want to know if, we've, if we're taking that into account and whether MnDOT can help us with that. And then second part of that question is, is can we do a traffic study or a, a traffic count now before the project starts to sort of get an understanding of the baseline? So those questions for both of you, but uh, Ms. Blanchard, if you could tell us how MnDOT can help us with that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, Chad, I can take this first uh, and then feel free to add on. So we are actually working right now uh, as as we've been talking and throughout the last few uh, weeks and into the next few on the traffic management plan during construction, we do recognize that a lot of traffic will likely go to Trunk Highway 62 as well as um, Trunk Highway 13 on the south side as well. So it, it will spread out in the eastern westerly directions. Uh, the We will and are anticipating that we will leave three lanes of traffic open in both the eastbound and westbound directions. So it will generally be as you see it today for the most part, uh, but we do recognize there could be some cut through traffic and are working to mitigate that. And we'll also be working during construction with the city of Edina to mitigate that as well. Thank you. And I would just add on the traffic counts, you know, we're required by state aid to do traffic counts on many of the routes you mentioned. So we have pretty up to date counts on those routes already. Mm -hmm. So we can see the changes related to this project as it goes through. Great. That's great news. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Both. And I think MnDOT has all that baseline count information at present. You're, you're doing those counts uh, consistently, I think, throughout the year. So this is my recollection from serving on the corridor commission. All right. And Chad, are you comfortable yet? Uh, are you comfortable so far with the uh, traffic management strategies? Yep. To we Member have, Jackson's point. Correct, Mayor Andrew Scipioni has been involved in all the tax, and I've been up, keeping up to speed on the on the project. And I believe we have a I think Councilmember Pierce maybe on the on the other group that's kind of the electeds on on the project team. So we continue to work with MnDOT, and, and thus far we're satisfied with what they're doing on a traffic management standpoint. All right. All right. Any other questions from council members at this point in time? Otherwise, I'm going to open this up for public testimony. Is there anyone in the audience that wishes to testify regarding this matter? I think so. Feel free to come forward if you do. I don't see anybody coming forward. Um, Director Benarat, do we have anybody online? Again, a reminder uh, for the folks that are listening in, if you want to call in to testify in this matter, uh, 800, there's your call-in number, 3740221, conference ID 919-8120, 919-8120, call in, give us your name and address, uh, operator will uh, uh, get you in the queue, you need to press star one and then Director Benarat will bring you in to speak to the council and provide your testimony regarding this matter. Director Benarat, anything? I do not have anyone on the line just yet. I would recommend we wait another 30 seconds or so just because there is that slight delay in broadcast. Yeah, let's do that because I, I gave him a little bit of a late notice on the number again, so. I think it's safe for you to move forward with your agenda. Thank you, Director Benarat. Uh, staff is suggesting that we employ the uh, method we've been using here during uh, our hybrid existence, and that is leave the public hearing matter open until noon uh, for public further public comment, noon on December 13th, and continue the action to the December 21 City Council meeting. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Pierce that we close the public hearing on this matter at noon on December 13th and then continue it for potential further action at the December 21 City Council meeting. Any further discussion? All those in favor of passage of the motion of the state say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, the next matter we have is uh, one that uh, 
Our animal control officer, Tim Hunter, has, and I don't know if you had anything uh, from a predicate standpoint there, Manager Neal? Uh, I, I do not. I just okay. wanted to say to the council, we don't do these kinds of hearings uh, very often. Um, we've had, uh, as I recall, maybe two in the last uh, 10 years, but Mr. Hunter is here. He's been a part of those, and he's uh, intended to come to the council and update you on this matter tonight. Thank you. Mayor Officer and Hunter, council members. Uh, nice to have you with us this evening. I think... Uh, Last time we saw you was to talk about coyotes. Uh, very likely. <laughs> yeah. So I good evening, you, Mayor. Uh, you became kind of a, uh, somewhat of a coyote expert. And, uh, Over 36 odd presentations and <laughs> consulting with three or four other municipalities. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got a different kind of matter here this evening. And, and somebody, we've got an ordinance that allows a certain number of pets, I think three, and there's a person that would like to have four pets, and I'm going to let you explain what it is. It requires a public hearing. Correct. And, um, and, uh, and then the council will have to make up his mind on how it feels about it. So go ahead. Yep. Very briefly, uh, I'm Tim Hunter. I'm the animal control officer for Edina. Um, roughly uh, two and a half, three weeks ago, we received an application from a resident who currently has three dogs and uh, would like to acquire a fourth. Uh, she did actually apply through the process, pay the fees and, and so forth. Then on our end, we went ahead and proceeded with our requirements under the ordinance and we sent out a mailing to the properties within 200 feet of the property, um, provided access for those residents or property owners to be able to make their comments to us over the course of the next few weeks and we got the um, application on tonight's agenda. Um, over the course of that time frame. Um, we did only receive two responses uh, from those mailings, and both were in support of the applicant. Uh, the applicant is here in the audience tonight, if you have any questions for her. Um, we, I looked into the records, and we have had no other uh, animal-related complaints involving her or the property that she's currently at. Um, the responses that we received were very supportive in terms of their uh, care and diligence with their current three dogs and did not foresee any uh, problems going forward with uh, them acquiring a fourth. Uh, based on all that information and the background and so forth, I didn't see any reason to object to that application. Um, and so that's what brings us to this evening. All right, so are you neutral on the situation or do you have a staff recommendation? I don't see any reason why not and based on why we shouldn't uh, go ahead and approve it and based on the uh, two uh, supportive responses that were quite specific about how well cared for their dogs are currently, I don't see any reason why we should deny it. Okay, so you, you didn't find any um, data or information relative to nuisance or that it would be detrimental to the public health, safety or welfare? I did not. With three okay. dogs currently, uh, we have had no complaints whatsoever. Uh, they've maintained licensure and so forth. They've, uh, as it were, they've towed the line with everything so far. So I don't right. see any reason that that would change. Okay. Thank you, Officer Hunter. Anybody else have questions for Officer Hunter at this point in time? All right. This is a public hearing matter. I know the uh, applicant is here, uh, Jessica Moody. 5225 Kelsey Terrace. I don't know, if, I mean, you certainly have the right to come and testify if you'd so desire. Well, if you have any questions, I'm going to ask. It's not, maybe it's yeah, why don't you, why don't you, why don't you come up here so we can hear you and get, make it part of the record. Hi, Jessica Moody, 5225 Kelsey Terrace. And hoping to add another puppy dog to our um, three current dogs. All right, well, why don't you stand by? There may be more questions, or maybe council okay. members have some questions now. All right, I'm gonna open this up. Uh, go ahead and sit down if okay. you want to, and uh, we may call you back up. Uh, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to testify regarding this matter? I'm gonna open it up for public testimony. All right, seeing nobody coming forward, hearing nothing. Uh, again, the uh, call-in number was just up on the screen a few minutes ago. Uh, it's going to come up again, I think, here, 800-374-0221. Conference ID is 919-8120, 919-8120. Press uh, star one, I believe, and then um, 
uh, you'll get an operator and the operator will bring you into the council through uh, via Director Benarat. Anyone on the line, Director Benarat? All right, there isn't anybody on the line that wishes to testify regarding this matter. Uh, we've got a couple of different options, of course, here. We could uh, do the same thing we've been doing on these hybrid m meetings and hold it open until the 13th of December, but uh, staff's recommending that we, if there was no uh, adverse testimony, that we entertain a motion to approve the permit from uh, Jessica Moody at 5225 Kelsey Terrace to keep four dogs. <laughs> Is there anyone who cares to make that motion for purposes of discussion? I'll make that motion. I'll, I'll move to, um, to close second? it tonight. Second. All right, we got a motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Anderson uh, to approve the <coughs> permit application of Jessica Moody at 5225 Kelsey Terrace to keep four dogs. Uh, any discussion? Based upon the record and based upon the testimony of our animal control officer, uh, all those in favor of adoption of the motion as stated to permit Jessica Moody at 5225 Kelsey Terrace to keep four dogs, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you, Ms. Moody. And then the next matter we have and the last matter in the public hearing portion of the agenda this evening is um, this is our truth in taxation hearing its tax uh, potential adoption of an operating budget and uh, there was at least one gentleman here uh, from Grandview Square that wished to, wished to testify but first we're going to have a presentation on the proposed uh, budget operating budget for 2022 and the proposed tax levy as well and we have Yes, McAn Ms. McAndrews, welcome. Alicia McAndrews, our finance director, is here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, and I will turn it over to City Manager Scott Neal. All right, Manager Neal. Thank you, Your Honor, and members of the council. Uh, tonight is uh, an important night in our, our year for our city government. Tonight is the night when we have our annual truth and taxation hearing, and we get to make our uh, propose our proposed budget to you for for 22 uh, 23 2022 2000 uh, excuse me 2022 and 2023 um, so we'll start first with our agenda for our presentation we're going to go over briefly uh, as, as briefly as we can our budget process and timelines our goals and values give you a big picture uh, with context talk a little bit about our strategies and our financials before we get to uh, our recommendation for you so tonight uh, we are in the uh, we are in an odd numbered year in 2021, and in an odd numbered year is the year when we take a look at our biennial uh, operating budget. So uh, the biennial period that we are planning for is 2022-2023. Next year, in an even numbered year, uh, we will spend most of our budget time looking at our five-year capital improvement program, and that five-year period will be 2023 through 2027. The timeline, uh, the timeline for making a, a, a city budget always starts with elected officials. Um, we have a city council, we have a city council retreat that kicks off our budget process in March. Uh, that's where we learn from you uh, what outcomes and, and direction you want to see for city government over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, the next period after that, from June to, to uh, about September, is a period where city staff are really trying to put together a cost factor for what it would cost to deliver that kind of vision for, for the community. And our first uh, real time that we put that together for you and show it to you is when we ask you to approve a preliminary tax levy for the upcoming year, which you did in September. We then take another look at the budget as it continues to get more refined in October, uh, and we did that on the 19th, and that really takes us to today, uh, where we have the actual budget hearing and city manager's recommendation that's before you tonight. Uh, 
I have the next portion of the presentation. Um, I would just note that the budget work plan and operating budget action that we're asking you to take this evening is really one piece of an overall strategic plan. And the long-term vision and strategy is set with our long-term guiding processes and documents, which includes our vision Edina, which looks out 20 years into the future of our community, the comprehensive plan, which is a 10-year guiding document, and then the five-year capital improvement plan. What we have presented for you today is a two-year budget work plan and operating budget. This really begins the implementation level plan of our entire performance system, um, which really drives then the remaining budget, work plan, and um, projects and tasks that happen throughout the next two years. Uh, like any budget, uh, what is included in the budget really reflects the goals and values of the community as identified by the City Council. And for several years, we've had very consistent um, budget pillars, strategies, and uh, terminology. We have changed a little bit this, this go around. Um, when we look at just some grounding of terminology, budget pillars, we refer to really those broad goals and outcomes that need to be achieved in every budget. They don't generally change that much from year to year. This year, council spent a significant amount of time discussing budget values. So aside from specific project strategies that we might want to fund, what are those guiding values that both council and staff want to look at throughout the years as we're making decisions? Decisions to consider the impact, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Finally, our budget strategies are really the two-year specific actions that we're going to take each budget cycle and the projects and tasks that we'll accomplish to really meet what we've identified our goals and values. Um, so looking at our four budget broad outcome goals or pillars, um, these have not changed significantly from our last budget. Uh, the strong foundation in that pillar, we're really talking about making sure that we have well-maintained city infrastructure, roads, streets, bridges, that our city buildings and facilities and recreation enterprise are enterprises are well maintained and that we have reliable secure technology that meets the needs um, and is able to respond during emergency services. In our reliable service pillar, we're really looking at all of the city services that we provide to enhance public safety, like our police, ambulance, um, our water sewer workers, our, and then our recreation programs that really enhance the quality of life. Uh, in Livable City, we really move to the external environment, and in this pillar, we're looking at what is the experience of the people who live and work within the city of Edina? Are they in neighborhoods that where there's affordable places to live that are walkable, connected? Are we fostering a sustainable environment? Do they have access to green space and internet uh, capabilities, for example? And then finally, the fourth strategic pillar is the Better Together, which is about fostering an inclusive and informed and engaged community. So this is where we really focus on do residents have access to the information that they want as it relates to city government and city services? And does everyone who lives within the city have access to our city institutions, facilities, and services? Budget values, uh, as a specific defined budget values are new this year, and this is um, what I had referred to earlier that council had spent a significant amount of time on. And in stewardship, equity, health, and sustainability, um, we're really looking at these four values in terms of all of the decisions that we make. So a stewardship, we're looking at what is the long-term financial impact to our investments and to the community. So we're focusing on um, the full life cycle of of the building or service and making sure that that's sustainable for future generations. In equity, we're looking at does everyone have access to be involved in government? Uh, are our uh, rules, policies, and ordinances enforced in an equitable manner? Um, and do all people feel welcome? Are we analyzing our decisions for what is the impact to different populations within the city? 
Um, third is health, where we're really recognizing that health is more than someone's just physical well-being. It's looking at emotional um, and social and mental uh, health as well. And so it's just analyzing the impact of our decisions to the physical, mental, emotional health of everyone who lives in Edina. And then finally, sustainability is making sure that our policies and decisions are helping us to uh, ensure a sustainable planet for the future and to reduce greenhouse gases, increase energy efficiency, um, and again, focused on that long-term health of the community. We're now going to, to kind of get into some of the, some of the unique or, or new uh, initiatives that we are proposing for our budget this year, our biennial 22-23 uh, budget. And there are some themes or some, or some trends that you will notice when we, when we talk about this and, and that are embedded in the numbers themselves. And one of those is, and probably first and foremost, is certainly investments in public safety. Um, when we talk about investments in public safety, we mean things like uh, our, our police department, obviously, but also our fire department, our community health. Uh, those are some areas, our 911 dispatch center. Those are areas where we've got some major improvements planned for the upcoming year, or upcoming two years. Uh, next is preparation for climate change. You're going to see uh, climate change mentioned in a number of different areas, uh, not just infrastructure either, as we want to prepare the community uh, for climate change in the future. We, we think that's very important. Uh, next is investments in capital improvements. Uh, we have successfully um, transitioned uh, about how we uh, budget for capital improvements in the future uh, with a, de a dependable property tax levy that we have not previously uh, did prior to six, five or six years ago. But uh, we'll show you what that looks like uh, going forward as well. Second, preserving and enhancing our strong local economy. Uh, we have a role in this, of course, and that role is, is played out in a number of different ways in economic development, uh, housing, uh, and other kind of business activities that we are involved in, and we'll talk more about that later. A greater emphasis on maintaining our current assets. Um, we, you'll see this as, as we talk about our facilities management functions and you know, making sure that we take care of the stuff that we already have and preserve it for the future, we think is, a, is an important statement about stewardship. Uh, finally, uh, we want to be the workplace of choice uh, for city employees, so making investments in how that happens. Some of that is in compensation, some of it is in fringe benefits, but there are other w things that we can do um, to make our, our workplace that a, a kind of a place where people come. The best and brightest is what we want to, to work here and serve Edina citizens. So next, the next slide we have here um, is just an all funds budget look um, at the city budget. So $140 million total. Um, where we'll be spending most of our time this evening is on the left-hand side, the governmental funds. Um, and that's where we collect the, most of the tax levy revenue, uh, particularly in the general fund. Um, but you also see the debt service construction and, and HRA levy there as well on the left. Um, some of the spending of the tax levy dollars also occurs on the right-hand side in the internal service fund for IT equipment um, and facilities. Um, and then in the middle where we won't be spending much time today um, is our enterprise funds, so liquor and parks um, and utility. Um, on this slide, this is the proposed levy for 22 and 23, and this excludes the special street levy that I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, but here, this slide really gives you a good look to compare our current year, 2021, um, to the proposed levy for 22 and 23 without the special street levy, as I said. Um, so from 20 to 21, there was a levy increase of 5.95%. From 21 to 22, we're proposing 5.71%, and then for 23, a 5.3% um, increase. The only piece that's missing from that slide is um, the special street levy. Um, this is an effort to invest in safe, affordable, accessible residential streets um, and, and fund it in a way that's shifting from special assessments um, to the tax levy uh, to reduce the burden on individual homeowners. Um, it's an incremental 16-year transition. Um, the first year of the tax levy is 2022, so each subsequent year we expect to see a lower increase um, to that uh, special street levy. 
And so here you see it in that highlighted blue, green, excuse me. Um, so overall, once we, once we bake in the special street levy, the increase that we're proposing is 7.97% for 2022. Um, back in September, when council approved the preliminary levy, you'll see that was at 8.98%. We have brought it down to 7.97. Um, and then for 23, the increase will be 5.76% as proposed. So now we want to talk uh, more about some of the specific investments and benefits uh, that are included in our 22-23 proposed budget. Um, and, and we'll do this under the, the four uh, budget pillars. And the first one is strong foundation. And the first set of, of improvements are in, the, are in the area of technology systems. Um, we're gonna replace our, our public safety 911 dispatch and record system. We're gonna add to our staff who, who work in IT uh, to support not only citywide services, which were really expanded and stressed uh, during the pandemic as we became more of a of an off offsite uh, work workplace, uh, but also a, a higher uh, um, a level of attention to cybersecurity issues. We we maintain millions of dollars of public information and data, and we need to spend um, we need to dedicate more real time to that and dedication to it. Uh, finally, we're expanding our city fiber optics war, uh, network, uh, which connects a number of different city uh, facilities to one another, and some of that is going to be done through our American Rescue Plan Act dollars to connect some of our utility functions. We talked earlier about uh, investing in, in, in our public facilities and infrastructure. Um, this is, when, this is uh, a, a chart that shows you in 2017, uh, we levied uh, just over $102,000 to uh, fund our CIP. It was very inadequate, as you, as you will recall. Uh, it was during that time that we set a plan into motion that would allow us to increase that property tax levy to the point now where uh, we are going to levy $2 million in 22 and 23, which is the same as, as 20, uh, 2021. Uh, for capital improvements, which really translates into residents uh, of fixing their parks, fixing their playgrounds, providing better facilities uh, for them to to do act, uh, uh, athletic activities in. So those are those those are areas where we make direct contacts and improvements for residents. Okay, moving to the reliable service. Uh, pillar, as Manager Neal noted earlier, uh, a quite a significant portion of our improvements are focused on public safety. One of those being improving the response and outcomes for mental health related calls for emergency services. In uh, the recent year, we have begun contracting with Hennepin County for a half time embedded social worker within the police department. That position and the work of that social worker has seen uh, very good outcomes and improved results. And in this budget, we would like to expand that contract to one full-time person, um, again, contracted through as a Hennepin County employee. Um, and then increasing emergency medical response for paramedic and ambulance services um, by adding three additional paramedic firefighters and then continuing to maintain the paramedic firefighters um, six of those were added two years ago along with the SAFER grant. So as you recall, the SAFER grant uh, contributed more funds in the beginning and then phases out over time. So this budget uh, includes those funds to continue those additional paramedics and firefighters from the ambulance service as well. Um, what you don't see on this slide um, right now, but we've talked about throughout this presentation and earlier is the um, additional support in public safety, one of which was already approved earlier tonight related to the technology systems for 911 dispatch and records management that will help them to better data or to better analyze crime trends and respond to those. Um, also, as you heard from Lieutenant White earlier, they have been redeploying staff to focus on um, those areas of greater need. Um, we are including also um, the planning portion of the fire department and fire, uh, the fire stations that we've talked about in previous council meetings, there's not a significant budget request for this as the details are still being worked out for that. That would come to you separate from the um, budget levy action. 
Uh, moving on to other reliable service, over the last few years, we've seen some significant changes in a couple of different areas, uh, one being data practices and records management, which you heard a little bit about from public safety, um, but that being an increase in requests and complexity of those requests overall, and just a greater need to beef up our resources within um, responding to public requests and also managing our records and our various systems throughout the city. The other change that we've been seeing is uh, a great increase in the both the number of elections and the complexity of managing uh, the different technology and especially the election security related to just the national trends that are happening. Um, so with that position, we would be adding one staff member partially paid for um, with support from the school district as well to help manage their elections as well. And then finally, um, as we talked about at the very beginning, the need for all all of these services uh, requires a talented, highly skilled workforce. We want to maintain the uh, employees that we have who deliver the high quality services and the current budget for this year does include a 2% overall market wage increase um, to help maintain that position within the market. Within the market. Under, our, under our livable uh, city uh, pillar, uh, it, we, the first item is implement climate action plan. Um, that may be a bit presumptuous on city staff part. Uh, that's coming to you later tonight for an actual approval. Um, but we think that there's strong support for that for council. We know there is in the community. And so the climate, preparing for climate change and, and showing where that's going to show up in our, in our system is what part of a livable uh, city is. So uh, implementing a sustainable build, building policy is all related to climate change. So is uh, advancing our tree protection and planting and planning actions. That's something else that we're going to be working on in the upcoming uh, two-year time period. And finally, around our our uh, environmental protection uh, functions, increasing the amount of street sweeping uh, that we do, which re which is a is a uh, labor heavy activity, is also important uh, because that's reducing the amount of, of waste and other pollutants that are getting into our surface waters. There we go. And the final pillar of our budget uh, this evening is Better Together, which again is the ways in which we foster an inclusive and engaged community. Um, you heard from Ms. Coyle earlier this evening about the process of the implementation for the ARPA funding, and we will be continuing and ensuring successful implementation that meet and benefit both the community and city operations. Um, we'll be working in the second year of the proposed budget, if approved, to improve our transparency tools and performance dashboards on our website to better communicate overall city performance in various areas and also um, to better communicate the budget to the public and we will continue with our com uh, completion of the quality of life survey that happens every other year to assess resident satisfaction with city services and the general direction and quality of life within Edina. We will also be continuing investment in our equity initiatives. This year in 20, uh, in the first year of the budget, so in 2022, we plan to wrap up the formal uh, 2018 race and equity implementation plan. So we'll be issuing our final report from those actions and then also um, giving you an update on plans to continue that work moving forward and to operationalize that within all of our departments and services. Finally, in Edina, we have a very robust boards and commissions process. We have a large number of actively engaged commissions um, with commissioners throughout the city. Um, we'll continue to support that investment and also to increase our resources and recruitment um, to uh, uh, better reflect the diversity of the people that our boards and commissions serve. So now we'll just shift to provide um, one level deeper on um, economic and financial information. Um, as you know, the um, Edina has a strong, diverse economy, and this was further confirmed um, by the rating agencies, again, um, giving us a triple-A bond rating. Um, it's also confirmed by the estimated market value for the city, which in 2022 is $13.8 billion. Um, 
which is the fifth biggest uh, tax base in Minnesota. And this tax base also includes adding back in the South Dale 2 TIF district, which will be decertified at the end of the year. Um, and that will add back $6.875 million to the tax capacity, which will be taxed in 2022. Um, on this next slide, the takeaway here um, really is that this increasing tax capacity that we've discussed um, is, is kind of met with, from the city perspective, um, a, a consistent level of, of taxing at the tax rate at about 27 to 29%. Um, and so looking at the slide here, we just want to share that relationship um, to show that providing this best-in-class services requires this reliable level of funding that's supported by um, the increasing tax capacity here in the city. Um, and to bring this kind of um, more closer to home, um, the estimated levy impacts on the median home um, valued in 2021 at $551,300 pays about $135 per month in property taxes um, to fund all city provided services. Um, with this budget, uh, the proposed property tax levy increase will um, affect the median valued home at $571,800. By about increasing the city property tax by 4.87%, um, or $80 per year, $6.63 per month, for an overall $142 payment per month to fund all city provided services. And just taking that number, 4.87% of the median value home, uh, or increase on the median value home, and bringing that into perspective of what we're seeing across all property types for the city. Um, in the change in property tax with this budget. Um, this chart I think is super helpful because you can see on the right, uh, for the median value home, it falls into that 66%. Um, so what you see here, kind of working your way from the top to the right, 15% of um, single family and apartment um, uh, property owners will be seeing a reduction or no change in their property taxes. And then 66% will be falling into this um, 0.1 to less than 5% increase. On the commercial and industrial side, it's a, a little bit of a different story. Um, with over 50% of the commercial industrial properties will see a property tax reduction, which I think is reflective of what we're seeing in the market right now as a result of the pandemic. But overall, most property owners will see a city tax change of less than 5%. So what will my 2022 city taxes pay for? Majority of the city tax levy dollars will support public safety, over 41%, or about 41%. 15% um, for public works, 19% uh, for debt service, capital outlay, 15% for general government, and then 10% for parks and rec. Um, What's driving the change in the levy? Here you can see a breakdown of what makes up that 7.97% increase for 2022. 3.4% for wages and benefits that Lisa described. 2.26% for the special street levy. 1.2% for service level changes, which is representative of the four new positions that, is, that are being added. 1% um, for maintaining the firefighters, the six firefighters that were hired with the SAFER grant because that grant is being reduced in 2022. Um, we're making an offsetting increase for, for the levy to support that. And then 0.62% um, increase due to inflationary cost pressures, which are then offset by some additional revenue assumptions that we're making. So, um, and then finally, the uh, just over 1% reduction from the debt refinancing. And then Scott. You know, the final stage of the budget making process is where I ask you to support the recommended uh, budget. And then, But before I do that, I want to answer a couple of, of kind of key internal questions tonight. We've talked a lot about uh, the what and the why. And this slide is really meant to emphasize the who. Uh, and the who is, is all about the the key employees that we have that really uh, make city government work for, for the people of Edina. Uh, we are a service-based organization, meaning that our, our biggest bills, our biggest costs are all around uh, employees. Uh, and we've got really a, quite a good team here. 
Um, so when I talk about uh, what we're going to be doing in the upcoming, in the upcoming uh, biennium, I really want to talk about the who for a little bit. Um, because our people are, are key to what we do. And some of our people are, our examples are the folks that st staff our 911 dispatch center. Uh, they are people that work in Edina, they know Edina, they know the people that they're sending to your home. Um, and they work here and, they, and they, they may not live here, but they work in this city and that's important. Uh, how about the skilled, uh, compassionate firefighter paramedics that come to your home in a few minutes, the caring and courageous police officers that are there to protect you. In the winter, uh, we have the best uh, snow and ice removal professionals in America. Um, that, Kate, that take care of our streets. We have a dedicated team of, of craftsmen and craftswomen who care for Edina's parks and recreation facilities and swimming pools and golf courses and ice arenas and all the things that are special about Edina and make it, make it a beautiful place. Uh, we have a great team of talented professionals that work on issues that are important to the community, uh, like affordable housing, environmental protection, race and equity, sustainability, and community engagement. Uh, we have a professional, experienced group of urban planners and engineers who work every day to make sure Edina's future homes, businesses, and industrial areas are safe, vibrant, and desirable in the future. Finally, we've got a solid group of conscientious stewards who make sure that our city government operations are properly funded, managed, and that our general operations are headed in the direction set by the elected leaders of our, of our community, the city council. So that's the who, that's who does this, and they're very important to our budget. Uh, the second question though is, are the services that, that we provide worth uh, the taxes that people pay? Uh, when we ask residents in our biennial quality of life survey in 2021 about the overall quality of services they receive from us, uh, they told us, 87% of them told us that the services they receive from city government are either, are either excellent or good. We also ask residents in that same quality of life survey how they feel about the value of the services they receive from the city compared to the taxes they pay. In 2021, 72% of our survey residents said the services they receive from the city uh, represent an excellent or good value for the taxes they pay. So clearly our residents are telling us that our services are excellent and that our services represent a very good value to them in terms of the taxes they pay. The package of services, pro projects, and programs that we've crafted into our proposed budget for the upcoming biennium are responsive to what the council and the community has asked for, and we think they're an exceptional value at $142 a month for, for the median single-family home owner. The city's biennial budget is the most important public policy document that the city council will approve in any year. I believe that. The proposed budget is ready for your final approval tonight, and I ask for your support for it, and we stand ready to answer your questions. Thank you, Manager. Council members, any questions for Manager or Assistant Manager Or Finance Director McAndrews. Council Member Jackson. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I've got some numbers on the budget documents that you included in our packet this evening. So starting on the first page, um, the summary of the proposed tax levies, um, the first question I have is the $20,000 um, for the Arts and Culture Fund. I just, it's my understanding that that's going to go into the HRA levy, is that correct? I I think it's just going away, if, if that's my understanding of that. It's a, it's a small levy, but I don't think we're incorporating it into the upcoming total levy, are we? No, my understanding was that the original intention of the levy uh, and having it established as a separate enterprise fund was that it was supposed to be funded by revenue, or I'm sorry, by donations. Um, and so that fund does have a fairly significant balance um, that the city still maintains as, and has access to. Um, and we could choose at a future date to increase that or to move uh, additional money into the general fund for that purpose. But it would not maintain a, a separate enterprise fund since we have not received additional donations or revenue to support keeping that as an enterprise fund. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, the second question is looking at uh, the debt service levy fund levies and then the construction fund levies, you can see that there's uh, 
law, a drop of 11.49% um, on the debt service fund levy and an increase of 25.67% on the construction fund levy. Uh, Manager Neal, can you explain to me how those two are related? Yes. A, co a couple of years ago, uh, we showed it on one of our slides how we really started a strategy to uh, to allocate revenue toward future capital improvements, so better parks, better warming houses, et cetera. We did that by being very specific and being very disciplined, I think, from a fiscal standpoint, that when we had expiring uh, debt service levies, so money that we were levying as property taxes to pay for uh, bond issues that had been fully paid off, we transferred that, that levy into a capital levy. So we kept assessing it, except instead of paying debt with it, we accumulated that money for capital improvements. So that's where it came from. Terrific, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I also <laughs> see on here, um, there's a note about when we purchased Weber Woods and the last payment was made in 2019. Um, can you give me a little bit of background about that? It's, I seem to, Remember, we bought it from the city of Minneapolis, and they we've been hearing a lot about Weber Woods. Is it true that that was originally slated for the city for um, to be redeveloped into housing or something like that? Can you tell us that I, story, please? I can. There was a, a piece of land that was actually in the cities of St. Louis Park and, and Edina, but was owned by the city of Minneapolis. And it had been purchased around the turn of the century, the turn of the 20th century. And it was going to be a well field. It was going to be part of their public water system. Um, so they were going to be drilling wells there, and those wells would be part of the Minneapolis um, public water system. Uh, they implemented some changes a few years ago where they didn't uh, they didn't need this land anymore. It was surplus land, so they wanted to uh, sell it at the highest price they could, and the highest price they could was offered by developers. And so they did lay out a proposed uh, development of this land, and I think in total. It's she had maybe 20 acres. Does that sound right? Something like there's 14, I think, on our side and maybe four or five on the St. Louis Park side. It's something in that nature. But they laid out a, a plan to develop that into a residential subdivision um, because that's how it was worth the most money. Um, we entered into some negotiations with them, uh, with the city of St. Louis Park, because neither city wanted that to happen. And we were able to acquire the land. And in, it, part of that acquisition was that we pledged not to develop it ourselves, uh, but also to make sure that when we developed it, it would be for the purposes of park or stormwater management or dog parks, so those kinds of community, those kind of community um, uh, purposes. And St. Louis Park did the same. Okay, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Um, and then moving to the first page of the consolidated proposed budget, two numbers kind of jumped out at me as being pretty um, significant increases. One was the increase in administration under the expenditures. Um, can you kind of talk to us about uh, why the almost 30% increase in that number and what that signifies? I think, and maybe Alicia can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a, is that where we're showing a staff, a, a new staff addition in the, in the clerk's office? That's part of the increase okay. um, is due to the staff position, but really, and this is kind of a wonky answer, the reason that you're seeing the increase is because we plugged um, some, some dollars there that will actually be spent in the fire department. It was just a function of how we assembled the documents at the time. So. Okay, and is that similar in the engineering line? That's a 64% increase. Is that uh, something similarly wonky? Or can you tell us about that? That's really driven by spending in the construction fund. So not staff related, but um, projects. Okay. That are in and I would just clarify too. So with administration, it the increase was really in the contingency fund. Mm -hmm. So a portion of that was, if you recall, when we came back, shortly before the preliminary levy and indicated that we were still trying to figure out exactly how to handle the state aid and fire relief association and the timing of the payments. So we kept that in the contingency fund so that we can move um, once we know the final amount that we'll need for the fire department to make up that 
uh, difference within the transition. And then in engineering, it is, yes, primarily the construction fund. And then also the wonky piece would be that sustainability has formally moved from administration into engineering. Terrific. And, and facilities as well. Good. Thank you very much. And those are my questions, Mr. Mayor. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Jackson. Um, Councilmember Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I really only, I've got a couple of questions. I'm not sure to whom they should be addressed. Okay. Um, the one thing I pick up on uh, in terms of uh, public safety, and this is under expenditures, I noticed that the police uh, funding for 2021 is at 17, uh, let's call it 17.8, which drops to in uh, budget year 2022, <clears throat> excuse me, to about 16,600,000 but then bumps up again in the uh, proposed or projected 23 budget to about 17.5. So that's a big drop off. I'm kind of wondering about that. Well, I, I can assure you, uh, council members, that we are not going to spend less in the police department next year than we did this year. I think what you're seeing in, in this move is an, an internal change uh, about how we budgeted and where we showed our, our spending and, and revenues actually for our community health functions. Um, we moved it in a couple of years ago uh, from the kind of the administration side into the police department, and we moved it again in the in uh, for the upcoming period, or actually last year, into the fire department. Um, we, we think that's a better home for it from an operational standpoint. So that's uh, when a budget moves to a different department, you often see that kind of hole created. Okay, I just I'm just trying to absolutely determine that we're not spending any less no, on police sir. protection in the no. course of this year. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. and that then I suppose speaks to the um, roughly two million dollar increase in the fire department budget. That includes it does. that, yep. and then are there any other inclusions in there? Well, there's there's a general increase in in fire staffing so that you'll see that's fully implemented. So there'd be that kind of an increase, but it's also this structural increase of adding community health into that budget. Okay, good. Thank you, mm -hmm. Manager Neal. While we're on that topic of uh, public safety, uh, from looking at one of the pieces of data that you supplied to us, it looks to me like uh, since 2018. Uh, through projected 2022, we're going to add 24 uh, police and fire uh, and uh, health uh, inspectors, if you will, to the uh, to the city payroll. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, that's that's correct. Um, we have added uh, a number of employees to our our payroll over the past four years, but it's. Uh, but most of the large majority of them have been in our public safety functions, whether they're in police uh, and fire and community health. And um, that's it's a primary area for our for us, for our budget growth. All right. And we're, as I understand it, short three officers right now. Have we provided for those three officers within the confines of the budget as proposed? Yeah, you, you know, when we talk about staffing in any department, but particularly in a, a a public safety department, we're probably always down an officer or two or three, depending on, on time of year and, and what's happening. But those positions remain funded positions. So when we are down a number of officers, we are we are trying to get out in the market and hire hire those positions. All right. That's that's all I had for questions. That prompt anything from any other council member? All right. This is a public hearing matter. Uh, for those in the audience that might be interested in calling in, uh, again, a reminder, 800-374-0221, conference ID 919-8120. Uh, but the first thing we're gonna do is to uh, let folks that are in the audience who might wish to testify regarding the proposed uh, tax levy and the adoption of the 2022 operating budget uh, come forward. And I know, Russ, I apologize over at Grandview Square. I didn't catch your last name when you were coming up before, but uh, come on up and we'll hear about your concerns about the budget or your observations. And give us your name, full name and address again, please. Yes, uh, Russell Fistrom, 5250 Grandview Square. I live in uh, unit number uh, 2103. 
Okay, my, my concern deals with the street levy. And, uh, thank you for the opportunity to make my presentation. I appreciate it. Uh, the uh, new street levy uh, no longer has assessments for each uh, neighborhood or each home. Uh, at Grandview Square, there's uh, two buildings, 5225 and 5250. We have a private street between our two uh, uh, buildings. Okay, we, we pay for that, you know, we plow it, we pay for it. Uh, uh, we assess our, 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 our people each year to, for the future when we have to repave it or redo it. And when I saw the street levy, I thought, well, then the, uh, that Mr. Neal spoke so eloquently about the great services the city provided. I thought, well, shouldn't we take advantage of the services the city provided? So I reached out to the engineering department and I asked them if we could give them the road. <laughs> you know, so now we have the services we're paying on our taxes. We have. 74 units at uh, 52, uh, 25, and at 52, 50, we have 50 units. My unit's assessed at uh, $505,000. You know, so I assume most of the other units are assessed at about the same amount of money. So you'll, we're looking at those units being assessed that amount of money for a spe special uh, assessment on the street levies that we have no take, we can't take any advantage of. So my question, the engineering department told me that I had to reach out to the council and the mayor and that they would be responsible for uh, any uh, changes in who owns the street and whether we could give it to the city. So, All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we'll discuss that here when we get done with the I'm sorry, hearing. I couldn't hear you. We'll, we'll discuss it in, in due course here. Oh. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else wish to testify regarding the proposed tax levy or the uh, proposed 2022 operating budget, 2022-23 operating budget? All right, uh, do we have anybody on the line who wishes to testify? All right, let's go back to uh, Director Milner on this um, issue or manager Neal, maybe it's something you and Director Milner have, have discussed a little bit. Well, this, this, this is a topic that uh, all cities face. Um, it, it, they're all a little different, but uh, there are private streets in, in most communities and, and it is not unusual for uh, the owners of those private streets to at some point approach the city about taking over the private street. Um, and I will say most cities uh, don't do it. Um, they, we, we haven't had much discussion in, in this case. We would certainly want to give some consideration uh, to the request and not just dismiss it out of hand. I think that's the fair way to do it. Um, but I can tell you that's what is typically done in, in cities across the state of Minnesota. Yeah, all right. Well, we certainly can take this up for consideration certainly. Uh, in the future. Uh, one of the comments uh, that was made by Russ was, uh, with regard, regard to the street levy, it means that we no longer have assessments for each home. But I think, Director Milner, you might want to provide some uh, clarifying language around that comment. Eventually, <clears throat> right, Mayor? Eventually we'll get to no assessments. 16 years home, from now. But 16 years from now, exactly. There's going to be a transition to no assessment. So this year we're presenting that next Monday, and, and local streets will be about 74% of, of a full REU, and state aid is a, is a little lower. So. Assessments will still be in there for the next 15, 16 years. All right, good. That prompt questions from any council members? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Systems. Uh, when, we, when we did talk about the street assessment issue, I heard from a gentleman on Duncan Lane, which is another private street. So I, if we were gonna talk about that, I hope that that's near my house and the Nine Mile Creek Trail. Um, but that, that, that I've heard this issue before about the private streets and the concern. So right. I wanted to add that. Yeah, so it makes a broader discussion about all private streets is what you're saying. Yes, please. Yeah, yeah okay. Mr. Mayor, what, what I would suggest is we look to the whatever the creating documents were. So for Grandview Square, there was a development and I assume that included a agreement between the developer and the city to have those streets be private. And, 
I don't know what the Duncan Lane story is, but it seems to me any decision we make on these ought to be taken in the context of what the deal was when it was originally done. Yep, that's, that's good advice. All right, so let's take that up. So one of the things we talked about um, in our work session, and incidentally, Manager Neal had uh, a chart up at one point in time talking about the process beginning way back in June. It didn't include any of the meetings that we'd had. Right. That uh, you know, there were numerous uh, in number about uh, working our way through the budget, including a session for an hour and a half uh, this evening, which was kind of the end of the of the line of conversations that we've had over time uh, since uh, actually since June. Um, so we got a couple of different things we could do here tonight. We could uh, have a motion to approve the resolution 2021-115, which would set the 2022 tax levy and adopt the uh, 2022 operating budget, uh, or we could um, do as we've done in some of these other hybrid situations is to uh, hold the public hearing open until noon on December 13th and then continue it to action for action to December 21st at our next city council meeting. Anybody have any thoughts on, on which pathway to follow here? Or Manager Neal, do you have any concerns or comments? That well, our, our concerns from, from a staff uh, perspective uh, were, that especially given the, the public hearing tonight, uh, that we would ask for you to approve it tonight. We understand that uh, we've, we've handled uh, other public hearings differently, um, but allowing this to be approved tonight does allow uh, our finance staff and other staff uh, some more time to get the, get the final budget uh, prepared for uh, the upcoming year uh, for the for posting on our website, submission to the county, submission to the state, things like that. So that would be our preference, but uh, we understand this is your prerogative. Member Sutton. Mr. Mayor, I'd move approval this evening. All right, is there a second? Second. Right, we got a motion and a second to approve resolution 2021-115 which would uh, set the 2022 tax levy and adopt the 2022 operating budget. Mr. Mayor. Yes, discussion. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, in our discussion upstairs, I think Assistant Manager Schaefer, you said that um, in the public notice that went out, people were um, alerted that we might make the decision tonight. Can you tell us what the wording of that um, notice was? Uh, no, I do not have the wording for that notice. I don't think it said in there that council would definitely make a decision tonight. It clearly noticed that that was when the public hearing was, that you could either call in or um, testify in person. I'm sorry, I don't have that specific language here. Okay, that's fine. But because this is a truth and taxation hearing, there was special notice sent out to every household mm -hmm. in, the, in the city. Right, that's right. So it's, it's a heightened level of community engagement. So you know, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to close down the public hearing early, but I also know that we told people tonight was the night and, and extra media um, than we do for most public hearings. So I, I feel comfortable that the public knew about this um, had, and had the opportunity to speak tonight. Yeah, so I, I think that you raise a good point, and that is uh, maybe you could discuss a little bit the uh, public outreach that we've had uh, along the budget uh, discussion since June. Is it just that one notification of the public, or have we had other forms of engagement with the public? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure what the exact engagement was, other than the preliminary the preliminary levy setting. And so certainly that was communicated in the truth and taxation notice that goes to every household. Um, our, our general city communications, I'm not sure what information or the timing of that as to when things were actually published. I don't know right. if Director Benarat, if there were articles that came out in advance, typically the articles about the budget are communicating what was um, in the popular annual financial report, what has happened. General communications did not give a, a date for your approval, just the date of the public hearing. Well, I mean, I'm satisfied that we've talked about this and talked about this since March, basically, and we've had that calendar out there. Um, I just want the public to know that we, we have reached out and talked about this, and so there was lots of notice about, about tonight's hearing. And so I feel a little more comfortable than, like I said, in the usual public hearing about closing it this evening. Others, others, other comments? All right, good. 
All right, um, we've got a motion and a second to approve uh, resolution 2021-115, which would set the 2022 tax levy and adopt the 2022 operating budget this evening. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you, everybody. Thank and you. thank you for that thorough presentation by all of you involved. I think it was really beneficial um, for the public and, um, and we, us as well. We so, appreciate your support. Yeah. Uh, now we're going to move on to reports and recommendations. And we've had folks in the audience uh, patiently waiting for this uh, moment in time. And we're going to talk about the potential approval of the Edina Climate Action Plan, which uh, we had previewed to us a bit by our sustainability manager, Grace Hancock. And tonight we're going to have a presentation by Hilda Martinez, who is the chair of the Energy and Environment Commission. Uh, Ms. Hancock may have some comments as well. I'm not sure, but we'll find that out. I think she's got some preliminary comments here. I can see her standing at the, at the lectern, at the podium. Ms. Hancock. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm pleased to introduce this agenda item to you for consideration this evening um, and to express my thanks to everyone involved, particularly the Community Climate Action Planning Team, the Energy and Environment Commission, and our facilitating partner, Pale Blue Dot, who advocated for, participated in, and committed to implementation of this climate action plan for the community of Edina. From the start, this has been community driven, and I have great faith that that spirit will continue as we attend to climate action here in Edina over the next 30 years. I'm going to turn this proposal over to the chair of the Energy and Environment Commission, Hilda Martinez, who also acted as liaison this year between the EEC and the Community Climate Action Planning Team, which was no small task. Um, so with that, Chair Martinez, welcome. Chair Martinez, nice to have you with us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, Mayor Hopeland, city council members, city manager, and city staff. As Greg just mentioned, I'm here as a chair of the Energy and Environment Commission, and I'm here to recommend that the City Council approve the Climate Action Plan. Um, the Climate Action Plan approved by the Energy and Environment Commission seeks to reaffirm the city commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emission by establishing a reduction target in city operation and community-wide emission of 45% below 2019 levels by 2030 and setting a net zero emission goal by 2050. These goals are compatible with the climate uh, Paris Agreement, published in 2015, and the recently published Hennepin County Climate Action Plan. As Grace already mentioned, this plan was developed in collaboration with a planning team of community members, business community members, institutional representatives, city commissions, and city staff throughout a number of planning workshops from April to September of 2021. The work also involved a community engagement process that cultivate community ownership by engaging them early in the process, by listening to their concerns, ideas, and inputs, and toward the end of the process also to review and provide feedback to the draft. Special attention was given to include on the resources communities who are more vulnerable to risk and impacts of climate change. By addressing eight subsectors through 36 strategies, supported by 200 action, the Climate Action Plan sets a roadmap for the city of Edina for the next nine years. This roadmap will not only tackle climate change, but generally will achieve environmental well-being, economic growth, and social equity. As I mentioned, these sectors have overarching strategies established to meet the 2030 mitigation goals and detailed actions for implementation. These 200 actions were selected uh, against a set of screening criteria that include impact of implementation, the co-benefit of the actions, game changer, and community and municipal support. The commu cumulative economic saving potential of the implementation of the plan through 2030 will be of more than $446 million for the city. And this is without considering the, the job creation and new business potential. It is also important to mention that this climate action plan is intended as a living plan rather than a static document. This means that the implementation phase of this plan should be characterized by intermittent measurement of progress and plan adjustment. So to make this a reality, the plan, the plan includes the development of one-year implementation plan, 
where the city manager needs to work closely with the city staff to specific work sequence and timelines for implementation, estimate the necessary funding, which I, 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 I see that they already consider, and staffing resources, and also an outline and accountability process to be presented to the Energy and Environment Commission for, for comments by the end of March 2022. Progress of today will be reported to the Edina Energy and Environment Commission and City Council on a semi-annual basis. Finally, this climate action plan could not have been possible with, without the active participation of different stakeholders. Therefore, I would like to have this opportunity to mention and thank them for their work and support. I would like to start with, uh, with thanking Grace Hancock, the Sustainability Manager, for her leadership in this process. Also, the consultant played Blue Dot for providing the necessary tools and knowledge that helped us guide the process and for, for completing this plan. All the community members and city staff that participate in the planning team for their time, commitment, and effort throughout the process. Also, to all community members that I see some of them here that were engaged in the process and they took the time to write and speak with you about supporting the plan. And last but not least, to all current for and former Energy and Environment Commissioners, like City Council Jackson, for making the case of improving of, of the importance of having a climate action plan. So with the approval of this ambitious climate action plan, the city of Edina once again will be showing its commitment for sustainability with its residents and leading the way as a green progressive city. Thank you very much. Well, I have to say, first and first, foremost, a personal thank you to you, Chair Martinez. This was a very big job, taking over the Energy Environment Commission during the pandemic and then working uh, through all of this remotely and then in person was just a huge effort. And I can't, and, and I, on behalf of the city, I'd like to give you a great big thank you for all the amount of work that you put into this. It's a really big deal. Um, um, so. I have to say thank you, but it's also part of the group, like the members we have and the, and the community members were also very, yeah. very useful in this process. Yes. So thank you. Yes. Thank you to everybody who participated. This was a big deal. I, when I was reading this, first of all, I just, there are so many wonderful things in it. I'm not going to take time to, to go over it, but I, I thank you all for um, your reflection of our city values and for the thoroughness of the work. I, every question I had was answered in there. So I'm like, did they look at this? Did they look at this? And so um, I, I'm not gonna go into details of that because I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of how we got here today. The city of Edina was the first city in the state of Minnesota to have an energy and environment commission. And those founding members really set some real fantastic goals. I believe that was in 2007, 2006 or 2007 when that was created. They were then the first group in the state of Minnesota to include the climate in our comprehensive plan. So in the 2008 comprehensive plan, we had a chapter and those members wrote that. There was no script to go off of and they researched it and wrote it and set goals and really uh, put our city on the path towards today. Um, in 2015, um, uh, Member Staunton and I served on the Partners in Energy um, Committee where we got some help from Excel Energy to sort of look at, assess our needs in the city and our capability of addressing um, greenhouse gases. And they really, um, pointed out, they set the structure for what we have to do. And also in 2015, what happened is we failed to meet our goals of 15% reduction by 2015. Um, and that prompted the current, the city council at that time, and I owe them a great deal of thanks for creating the, sustain, the conservation and sustainability franchise fee or the fund, which is funded through franchise fees as a mouthful. Um, but what that did was it not able us to hire a staff person, and that made all the difference in the world. And Ross Bittner um, was our staff liaison before, and kudos to him for his fantastic work. But he has a full-time job, and when we got that sustainability um, coordinator, it really uh, made a huge difference. Um, Grace's predecessor, Tara Brown, uh, she was under pressure to do a climate action plan right away. And what she did was instead very smart, and that was to meet with the staff 
across the entire staff and to start embedding um, principles of a sustainability in what everybody does. And I thought that was really an interesting um, strategy, but it's paying off today because as you can see in our budget, sustainability is a part of everything the city does. So kudos to her for making those relationships. And then kudos to um, coordinator uh, Hancock for the work that she did to deliver this today. So, you know, in our, um, I also have to have a shout out. I have a lot of people to thank because this has been a big day coming. It, it's, it's, a, it's a complex document, but boy, the, the shoulders on which it stands are many and, and, and strong. And our student commissioners, um, going back to when I was first on the commission, they've been the voice that have driven this over and over and over again. We have to act, we have to act, we have to act. And without their um, insistence and strength, um, we wouldn't be here today. So it's a big deal, many, many, many thanks. And, um, and I'm very excited to see this plan today. You could have fooled us. We didn't think you were that excited. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for those uh, heartfelt comments. I think they were very appropriate. <laughs> and especially with your close tie from having served on that commission, as you mentioned at the end of your remarks, it really uh, uh, makes it even more special for you to see this pass, I think, or about to pass. And I'm going to turn now to Councilmember Pierce. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, and I just had a couple of comments to make. Um, first, just thank you for the work. Um, congratulations for getting to this milestone. Um, there's been a lot of community support. Uh, we've received tons, I would say tons of emails uh, of, from residents asking us to uh, support. And when I see that kind of um, um, support from residents, that just means to me that we've done a really good job of communicating um, and an excellent job of telling the story. And so that's really one of the things I, I wanted to mention most. Um, in the action plan, the, um, the Edina's future climate, uh, I'm gonna call it a slide, it's in the PDF. I don't know if it's a slide or not. But um, like I, we get questions all the time, is climate change real? And that one slide, like it tells the story. And, and I think any time that we can talk about benefits, value um, in a story that people can understand and internalize, I think that's the way to do it. And so I, I think that that, for me, that was one of the, the uh, central pieces that um, if someone sees that, can really start to understand what the impact is. Um, and so thanks again um, and congratulations. Yeah, thanks Thank Member Pierce. Member Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Chair Martinez, um, the amount of work that you put into this and, and others, uh, I see staff's fingerprints all over here. I know that there was a tremendous amount of work put in by all. In fact, it's a massive job, and I, I know that you know that. Most people who are watching this are endorse the plan, wouldn't even be able to comprehend how much time you spent on this. So I thank you very, very deeply. It's a, it's a, tremendous, uh, it's a tremendous project. I, the important piece about it to me is that you don't know how to get where you're going until you have a map. Mm -hmm. And I think that what, what this, what this does is it lays out a plan. More importantly, it allows people to see and to view what is possible. And I, I appreciate that, so thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Member Anderson. Member Jackson's comments uh, talking about the Dinah's, um, oh, 15 year commitment really to um, uh, energy and environment improvement and reduction of greenhouse gases makes me think about a couple of other firsts that we had along the way. And we were the first city, I think, to have property assessed clean energy uh, project over at uh, uh, Grandview uh, on K Hill and 70th. Um, I remember Senator, then Senator Franken was here for that because it was the first, I think, PACE project, commercial PACE project in the state. And then I think our community solar garden on top of the public works building is probably the first project of its type uh, in the state as well. 
nonetheless, with the environment, you feel like you just can't move fast enough. And, and the guy who's been kicking us in the pants for all of those years is uh, Paul Thompson, who is our, our preeminent, I would say, our preeminent environmentalist in Edina, who has been worrying about the planet and the consequences of greenhouse gases for decades, long before anybody really thought about it. And, and the members of that Climate Action Plan team, I'm gonna list all those names, and if you're here in the audience, please stand up. Uh, Mindy Ayler, uh, Kate Ebert, Sean Ewan, Sarah Irwin, Janet Katui, Anna Martinez, Hilda Martinez, Lou Miranda, Jack Miller, Connie Mitchell, Rick Murphy, Bill Sirks, Paul Thompson, Gail Zembel, and then of course those city staff members uh, that Councilmember Jackson talked about, Ross Bittner, Jeff Brown, MJ Lehman, Heidi Lee, Chad Milner, Bill Neuendorf, Luther Overholt, Brian Stevens, Tom Swenson, and Solvay Wilmot. But really, I, I have to give great credit to our sustainability manager, Grace Hancock, who uh, has just been a delight to have working for the city and uh, has been such a fabulous addition to our, our, our staff and our community. So Grace, thanks so much for uh, all the guidance you've given this group as well. And uh, so, <laughs> yeah, a round of applause for everybody. On a 145 page document that's just chock full of important things to be thinking about in terms of, of, of the environment and how we, how, we, how we save this planet. Um, so we've got a uh, request to approve the Edina Climate Action Plan. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Got a motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Staunton that we approve the Edina Climate, Act, Climate Action Plan. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Now we've got, uh, thank you. Congratulations everybody. Work on it. And now we're gonna do a little photo. The entire council is gonna go down here in front of the dais with uh, a group of folks that gotta have a big banner uh, that they wanna un uh, unfold and use it for a photo opportunity. So let's all go down there. James, can you move this way just a little bit there? doesn't look much bigger. I <laughs> the next matter we have before us is uh, one that we uh, took testimony on a couple weeks ago and Director Milner has this matter which is a uh, potential approval of a, a resolution dealing with a right-of-way easement vacation at Pentagon Village. Director Milner. Thanks Mayor, members of Council. 
Um, we opened the hearing at the last council meeting, kept it open for a week, and received no comments from the public on this matter, so we'd recommend approval of resolution number 2021-109. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. All right, we got a motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Pierce to approve resolution 2021-109 which is the approval of a right-of-way easement vacation at Pentagon Village. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion of stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Uh, and then we've got um, three matters. Thank you, Director Milner, for your good guidance on that. And then we've got three matters that uh, our economic development manager, Bill Neundorf, has that deal with the American Rescue Plan um, that Annie talked about uh, earlier in the meeting and the uh, first matter there is a potential grant to the Edina Chamber of Commerce. And uh, Manager Neundorf, nice to have you with us. Yes, good evening, thank you. Uh, this item is one of three that you had mentioned that address uh, allocating a portion of the city's uh, ARPA funds towards our local business community to help uh, them keep doing what they're doing and do it better and stronger. Um, so this grant agreement tonight is with uh, the Edina Chamber of Commerce. Uh, they are a long-serving nonprofit here in Edina, um, and throughout the pandemic, they certainly suffered uh, significant economic declines with lagging membership, canceled events. Um, expenses were still there, but the revenues were gone. Uh, so the grant, grant agreement has been uh, prepared by our city attorney. Uh, our consultant, Annie Coyle, has really taken the lead on this, working with David Kendall and with the organizations. Um, the intention of these grants is, is $100,000 for the Chamber of Commerce and then a, another $100,000 for the 50th and France Business Association to allow them to reinvigorate themselves, uh, to, to retool as needed and keep doing what they're doing to, pr to promote business here in Edina. So staff certainly recommends the approval of this grant agreement. Uh, the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce Executive Director, Lori Severson, is with us tonight if there's any questions. And myself and Annie are, are available for any questions as well. All right, very good. Uh, council members have questions with respect to, I'll, I'll ask uh, with respect to either the potential uh, funding grant to the Adana Chamber of Commerce uh, uh, or the 50th and France Business Association, both the voices of small business in our particular community. Questions from council members? All right. Um, do you want to take them in order, Manager Neundorf? Oh, yes, we, we need right, approval uh, for each Is there one. a motion to approve the American Rescue Plan uh, Act state and local fiscal recovery funds grant agreement with the Edina Chamber of Commerce. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Member Jackson, second by M Member Pierce, that we approve the American Rescue Plan Act state and local fiscal recovery fund grant agreement with the Edina Chamber of Commerce. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. And then on to the um, uh, potential funding grant for the 50th and France Business Association. Yes, the same exact story here. Uh, this is a grant agreement between the city uh, and the 50th and France Business Association. Uh, they su suffer the same economic injury and we're hoping to help them come back and do, do what they do even better. Uh, Judy Johnson is their executive director and she's with us here tonight as well. Happy to answer any questions, but staff wholeheartedly recommends that this grant agreement be approved. All right, I think you made a, a good observation there. I want to thank Lori Severson for being here and Judy Johnson for being here as well. Um, is there a motion to approve the ARPA state and local fiscal recovery funds grant agreement with 50th and France Business Association? So moved. Second. Second? 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 Yep. Member Pierce? Second. All right, motion member Anderson, second member Pierce. Any further discussion? All those uh, in favor of approving the ARPA state and local fiscal recovery funds grant agreement with 50th and France Business Association say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. And uh, Judy, you want to stand up for a moment, please? A lot of folks don't know Judy uh, on this council, but Judy used to be the mayor of Plymouth years ago. And then uh, she was over at the Met Council as a Met Council member representing her district. And now you still, did you go back on the city council? Oh, you, serving the Met Council right now. Yeah, serving the Met Council, you, but you were on the council for a while, I think. 22 years. Yeah, wow. so just couldn't That's get wonderful. over serving Plymouth. And it's, uh, <laughs> and I have to admit, you've done a great meeting. Yeah. Entire <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your support. We really appreciate it on behalf of our board of directors. It means a great deal to us and our businesses. So yeah. thank, you. thank you. And Lori Severson. 
Cool. Thank you so very much. You know, we've been working with our business. Why don't you come forward, both of you? Why don't you come each to one podium here, and then you can make those comments so we can get it on the record. I think uh, Director Benarot's making a good point. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we've been working with our businesses for the last six to eight months, and while some of them have put the pandemic in the rear view mirror, there are still so many um, businesses and employees that are suffering the effects of the pandemic. So we're very grateful for the opportunity to be able to serve those, those individuals and businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Severson. And then Judy, go ahead. Thank you, Judy Mr. Johnson. Mayor. Thank you, city council, council members and staff. I would echo what Lori just said, and I would also say if it were not for the $100,000 in American Rescue Plan Act funding that the 50th and France Business Association is receiving, we might not even be here today. It was that, that dire coming through with the pandemic. You all know that we were not able to hold the Adina Art Fair in 2020 or 2021. The good news is that it's coming back on June 3rd through 5th, and we're very excited about that. This funding is really going to allow us to do some wonderful things for the association, and we look forward to reporting that to all of you as, as we roll out the plan in the next year and a half. And I do want to thank Annie Quayle and Bill Neuendorf for all of their tremendous support throughout this whole process. We couldn't have done it without them and appreciate all of their help. So thank you very much for your support. Our business community is very grateful and we have so many exciting things lying ahead for 50th and France. Yeah. Thank you, Judy. And your, your Music Ant group is doing a great job down there. I've never seen so many people down at 50th and France on the weekend with all kinds of activities going on. And, I give you a high credit for that uh, and all the innovation of that group. So thank you. Now, one thing we're not happy about with Plymouth is they, they edge by us on total market value. Oh. So they pushed us from fourth to fifth. But well, nonetheless, uh, all that biomed up there, all that uh, med device stuff, it's a good thing to have in the region. Well, and it's a wonderful thing because as you know, we are individual cities, but we make up an entire region and an entire state. So we're all in this together. Yep. And I really do appreciate uh, the better together scenario that you've put together here. We were part of that early on in our process. We've kind of adopted that same theme at the 50th and France Business Association. And um, it's just really great to see such a wonderfully led city by all of you and um, kudos to all of you. Thank you. Good. Right. Thank you. Thanks for being with us this evening. And then the last one we have is, um, a potential rescue plan agreement with Comcast Cable Communications and Manager Neal, this is really, uh, and, and Director Neundorf, an important one to talk about, I think, because it kind of goes to the heart of one of the things that we noticed during the pandemic, and that was that some of our kids were having a hard time being able to learn virtually because of uh, uh, inadequate access to the internet. Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor and members of council. You know, when we, when we started uh, a discussion around how do we extend uh, broadband services to parts of the community where it wasn't present or wasn't present in a, very, uh, in, in a very high quality, we really were starting to talk about how do we incent someone to build new broadband, put cable in the ground, put fiber optic in the ground. And as we started working our way through that discussion, it was clear that that was a, going to cost a lot of money, and B, it was going to be slow. And really, we were dealing with a situation that needed a remedy, like right now, right? So, so we had a, a discussion with Comcast, and, and they made us aware of this, of the Internet Essentials Program. And I wonder if, if, uh, An if Annie or, or Bill could just tell a little bit about that program and about what it means. So it's a program that's been in existence for a while that provides low cost, high speed internet access to households. So the conversation here in the city was that we want to get as many people enrolled in a program like this and then support the people that are enrolled in that program in the immediate future um, with these ARPA funds. And so this is monthly subscription service with Xfinity Internet. We know that that's high quality. We know the speeds that they're going to be providing. And it's, um, as Mayor Hovland mentioned, it's for any children, households with children that need it, but also households with small children who are not school age, households with adults who are job seekers, households with older adults who just simply need access to the Internet. Everyone needs access to the Internet at this time. So that's the, um, the main push of this program is to provide that, provide that free internet access for the next year for eligible households. Good. Questions for Ms. Coyle or comments? And we have somebody from Comcast with us this evening too. So uh, 
Uh, just direction. thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to be clear, so what we're doing is we're funding this for a year, mm -hmm. but once these families have made the connection with Xfinity, they can continue on in this program at a reduced rate. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Manager Neal, anything further? Well, only to say that we have, you know, the council has approved a, a half million dollars for this program. When the money is gone, the program is over unless we refund it with other with other dollars. Member Stoughton. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about, um, I understand there's also some other funds available for this from federal sources, state sources that are independent. Are we, are we aligning together with those? Um, Ooh. Or is that Comcast's job? Or um, and I only understand this from I don't know a radio ad or a <laughs> or a TV ad that I heard that said you know if you're having trouble getting access that you can tap into these funds, et cetera. So I'm I'm guessing there's other avenues by which we're yeah, you know Comcast is getting assistance in providing this to we folks will, who need it. We'll, we will look into those other avenues as well. Just want to make sure we're yeah. aligning with those as okay. we do that. Good. All right. Is there a motion to approve the American Rescue Plan Act agreement with Comcast Cable Communications Management LLC? So moved. Second. Got a motion by Member Jackson, second by Member Staunton, that we approve the American Rescue Plan Act agreement with Comcast Cable Communications Management LLC. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the passing the motion as stated, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. All right. Thanks for being with us, Andrea. Appreciate it. Um, it's a wonderful program that you've put together at Comcast and really look forward to helping out the kids in our community through this program and, and um, keep it up. I think it's important that you, you do these kinds of things that are uh, quasi philanthropic, I would say. And I don't know if you want to have come forward and say anything on behalf of Comcast. You're certainly welcome to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. I'm Andrea Kyer, and I'm also at 6012 Olinger Boulevard here in Edina. Uh, we just want to say we're really excited to, to do this partnership. We're um, starting to do them with local governments and um, to get in there. And it's so important to be connected and to identify those in the Edina community that, that need the service because... You, you, telehealth, school, all of that is so important. So, Scott, and I know Annie, we've gone through all of this, so we're just excited to, to try it out. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so, we've got a couple of sketch plan matters this evening that we're going to um, listen to. And the first one involves 4701 77th Street West uh, down in that Pentagon Park neighborhood. And Director Teague has this matter. Director Teague. Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. <clears throat> um, so as mentioned, this property is located at the intersection of Computer Drive and 77th. The proposal is for a seven-story, 189-unit apartment and uh, condominium townhome project. 10% of the units on the main level would be for affordable housing. Those would be owner-occupied housing. When the application initially came in, the, uh, the applicant had indicated that they would conform to the comprehensive plan in terms of density. The number of units that they're proposing here exceeds our comprehensive plan limit. They've informed me today that they would like consideration of that. I had indicated in my memo that they would be compliant with the comprehensive plan. They're now telling me today that they need those units in order to proceed. So this project would require a comprehensive plan amendment also with a formal application. Given that the comprehensive plan is, well, just a little over a year old, staff wouldn't support an increase in density, but they would like your consideration um, for that issue as, as you discussed this evening. So with that, uh, Dean DeVolis and Sheldon Berg from DJR Architects are here to present the details of the project. Did you say staff would or would not support an increase in density? Would not. Okay. All right, thank you. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be in person again. Yeah, nice to see both of you again.
much easier to operate than Zoom. Selden, go ahead. Good evening, uh, Mayor, members of the council. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, I will um, do a brief overview of the project. Sheldon, uh, would you identify yourself, please? This is uh, Sheldon Berg with DJR Architecture at and, uh, 333 Washington Avenue in Minneapolis. And Dina Volis, DJR Architecture, same address. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, so I will um, just run through a few highlight items. I think you've already received the packet, so you probably have some familiarity with the project already. Um, as Mr. Teague said, uh, 189 units on a 2.37 acre site. And, um, and as you said, on um, 77th Street West and Computer, um, largely surrounded by obviously Pentagon Park to the west and that redevelopment and um, a couple industrial and commercial buildings to our east and north, uh, as you can see on the site. And then um, I'm just gonna scroll through a few to some more salient elements. Um, and there is a high water table at this site, so we'll be considering that as part of the development, um, both in terms of the structure um, as you'll see, the, um, the ground floor is comprised of, um, excuse me, I just want to get to the site plan. Um, the ground floor site plan has got uh, townhouses around the perimeter of the building on three sides, northeast and west, um, which then uh, um, disguise or, or hide the, the parking, which is all above grade due to the high water table in the area. Um, what these also do is provide a, a, a platform or a podium for the upper levels to set back um, and provide a little um, visual break you know, along the um, sides of the building. Also gives it some depth, um, more of a pedestrian character along those two sides. Um, you'll also notice in the site plan, which I think I can possibly zoom in a little bit, as is that, Okay. Um, that what that what we've also done as far as the development of the site is um, brought the um, the curb in with the sidewalks to provide some parallel parking, which also would provide um, some more pedestrian scale. So pedestrians would not be next to Seventy uh, Seventh Street, which obviously is a fairly busy street, um, and it provides um, ready-made um, parking for get visitors, guests. Uh, prospective tenants, those types of things. Um, the, uh, the shape of the building um, basically fronts the 277th Street and, and Computer Avenue um, with the five-story portions of residential above that two-story podium and, and then opens to the back for a courtyard and um, some amenity spaces on the, on the south side. Um, we are reserving a little room in the back corner or the back side there on the south side for some of that stormwater um, um, elements, and then also provide a buffer from the neighboring property there to the south. Um, um, obviously along the two streets, we'll have uh, street trees and other amenities, and then there's uh, private patios for the for sale townhomes. Um, and then, I will just point out each of the townhomes, that, which are for sale, uh, part of our affordability, um, has a pair of um, parking stalls that are dedicated to each one as well within the garage, as you can see here. Um, and we are planning to have those be 10% of the total units for the project. Um, the project, uh, um, this just gives a little illustration of the shape of the building. Um, I guess I'll go back up to the images to just illustrate the materials we're looking at. Um, we have a combination of, of uh, brick, um, stucco, um, some metal panel, as well as um, cast stone in the back around the garages. And then um, I believe you're probably all aware that we received some comments from um, Mick Johnson and um, their studio, and um, we are 
I'm thankful for his comments. We are receptive to a number of them. Um, we think that they can add some further definition of the plan and pedestrian friendly. And, and that's when that's when we want to uh, sort of some flexibility and density because his idea is unique of wrapping the townhouses around the entire building, in which we may take the road around the entire building. Which then, if the parcel to our east is ever developed, it could mirror that kind of townhouse development with its respective building, then you start creating a street hierarchy. So that gave a flexibility in terms of how this neighborhood could be set, because we're one of the first buildings along with uh, Solomon and others. So if we can get this right in terms of the street activity, the townhouse, the ownership component, the affordable ownership component, and even develop the beginnings of what I call a main street, which is I have 7th and the secondary streets between the buildings, now you got a chance of creating an interesting hierarchy. So the reason why we made the request is to see if that idea could really fly and open and really start to create a development pattern, which is really an emerging neighborhood in Edina, because we're one of, I think, three projects proposed in this area. And so if this can help set that development pattern, it can really lead to some of the uh, richness that was described in the Pearl District in the original Southdale study. So that's sort of the basis of why we're taking those suggestions seriously, because we looked at it, it really started to provide a roadmap of creating an interesting neighborhood hierarchy. Good. I Thank think you. The, the final thing that I'd maybe mention too is, is as well as um, the location of the project, um, it's got you know obviously quite a number of good adjacencies to it, including the, um, the bike paths, um, Fred Richards to some degree, and you know that's a future decision to be made, but um, you know, all those things could, could add a lot of character and um, amenities to this project as it could add to um, the neighborhood as well. It's for, it gives more potential for Fred Richards because now you start having a community as opposed to just basically sort of today it's a vacant buffer. As this community develops, this park could develop with it, which really enhances along with the bike trail and aspect. So there's a lot of great potential in this area in terms of what could come and what could really become an interesting new neighborhood within the city of Dine. And then if we others follow the idea of creating an affordable ownership, which has been developed in Dine for decades, I think the last effort was Centennial Lakes, it really provides a path not only for affordable rental, which I know the city has been working on, but now adds a companion of affordable ownership, which really will start to increase housing options within the city. So I think we're mm -hmm. concluded and we stand for questions. Thank you. All right, what about um, some of those comments that Mick Johnson had, he was talking about landscaping options. It was the two big things he talked about. And then the back of the building, I was looking for a south elevation here. The back of the building is very blank by its design. And then he had about a half a dozen suggestions uh, on things you could do to improve it. I heard you say you're generally in favor of some of them. I don't know which ones and maybe you wanna Articulate that, but there, yeah, there's a there's a south elevation that would be helpful for you to respond to those comments that he made, and then also on this concern that Director Teague has about dwelling units per acre. You know, I think it's 80 is what's permitted over there. I don't know what you want. We'd, we'd be permitted 177 per the current um, limits. Is that correct? And we are proposing 189. Um, Nick had suggested adding some to. You know, sort of complete the the um, uh, donut of townhouses. Yeah, yeah, the the, the sort of buffer of, of townhouses to, to hide the parking, um, which you know I think we could we would be open to, um, and um, you know I think a lot of his landscaping suggestions are are certainly viable and and could be um, taken into account um, in the project. So I don't think there's really any issues there. I think. So, they're good, they're good comment, comments. So this backside would have contained the same, like Sheldon mentioned, we'd right. bring the townhouses back, create this zone. A, a narrow, what I call a private drive that would bring the site with the idea of the building to the east, the south, it's south yep. I'm sorry, is ever developed. It could mirror that street and have its row of townhouses and possibly. So yeah, that's what we thought was really a good beginning of uh, building on. So yeah, we're generally accepted those as positive and really want to work off of those. All right, I'm gonna to turn to Member Pierce now, and I didn't mean to uh, jump in there right off the bat, but I'm gonna to turn to Member Pierce for his comments. 
thank, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple of comments, um, and mine are all really directed towards the um, the um, compliance table that's in the packet. So when I look at the the um, the standard for this and the proposed setbacks. That seems pretty significant to me um, to go from um, you know, the 87 feet to 28 feet for this proposed structure. And then the front on Computer Street, again, is 87 feet, uh, proposed is 35. And then on the side of the building, um, on either side, again, 87 feet for either. And then the proposed is 45 and then 35. Um, that seems pretty significant to me. Uh, it was intentional. If we wish to create a sense of activity on the street, you know, today, if you look at the building directly to our south, set back from the street, parking in front of it, tends to create a very vacant street, especially in the pedestrian realm. Our idea is to pull the buildings, building closer to the street with the resident entries coming off computer, coming off the 77th, and create their friends that activate it. Those big setbacks tend to create sort of a, a vacant looking neighborhood. And if you mm -hmm. look at Mick Johnson's suggestions, that was one of the ideas of addressing the street and giving the building presence there. So that was intentional to still provide a setback, still provide a front yard greenly, but really have the idea of entries and identity and eyes on the street as opposed to what's currently existing as parking lots or vast lawns of the uh, occasional bushes. So that was on purpose to set a pattern of making the streets more pedestrian, more active. Yep. So I understand that from your perspective. Where I'm going though is it, it makes me question the comprehensive plan. And so I I don't it's tough for me to kind of rationalize what the developer is proposing and then what's in the current plan. Um, and my perspective would be we should look at that first and then determine um, what kind of development um, structure we want um, in, in terms of a development pad in that space, unless what I'm looking at is incorrect. Um, and so that's one. And you don't need to address that today, but that's, that's what's in my mind. Um, the second is... Um, I, I really don't understand the um, the comment about the density, um, and so Mayor asked that question, um, and so to the developer, why why do you need the increase in density um, based on what's recommended in the comprehensive plan? Okay, so but. Part of it was the flexibility of responding to Mick Johnson's townhouses. In okay. this case, actually wrapping this more with additional units, I think creates a better development, especially of the ownership side of it. So that's why we sort of when Carrie said, Carrie, please ask council that, because we like to have a little bit more of that flexibility to make those additional units to basically enhance the site, especially at the base. So right now we have, I think, 19 ownership. We increased to 25 to 28 on the basis, and that's where we really want to sort of put the bulk okay. of that emphasis because this idea of this affordable ownership with rental, I think, can really be some exciting and interesting, mm -hmm. and that's why we uh, asked Carrie to please present that to council. Oh, yeah, thank you. I, so I appreciate that. Um, and then the... Um, just the last comment, it, it feels like the only, or I guess this is, doesn't just feel this way, I guess this is fact. The only thing um, that's met is the height, the, so the stories. Um, and so this is, this building is shorter proposed than what is in the current plan. Um, and so I just have, my concerns really are questioning what are we trying to do on this site? Um, and is it right? Is this development right for this site? And so a lot of ideas that you're presenting 
Um, I support those ideas, but I mean, they do have to kind of work within the construct that we've set forward. Uh, and it feels like there's a lot that would need to change here um, in order to uh, move forward with the development as is. So thank you. Well, thank you. Member Sutton? I don't have a lot to add. Um, Mr. Devolos, was um, the building next door? Weren't you in on a sketch plan on that one? The uh, rise deal? What's the latest status on that? Uh, latest status, and I'll be truthful, a competing firm uh, sliced our bid in half, and we decided to take it, but work on this instead. So it's actually a different architect that's working on the Solomon proposal. And that would be for what kind of use? Uh, theirs, I don't know everything about it because I'm not the architect of record on that project, but uh, they're, they're adjacent to the parking ramp, they're putting in residential. Okay. Well, I don't, I don't have a lot to add. I, I would echo a lot of the comments that, that Council Member Pierce made in terms of, you know, it would be good <coughs> to comply with the plan. Um, I think housing is good in this area, how you're going to address 77th and computer will be important um, and, you know, how it fits into what the future is going to be. One question for um, Director Teague. The, the project we approved across the street, was that compliant with the density requirements? It was. Okay. Just slow him. Slow yeah. Him. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank Mr. you. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you got, this is interesting. Um, <clears throat> first, the potential for affordable ownership is extremely attractive. Uh, we, it, the last time that you proposed something along those lines, that was, I, I thought, the best part of what you were proposing over on Valley View. Um, and, and it's, in many ways, the most attractive part of what you're, what you're proposing tonight. Um, now, I don't know where your unit count is going to wind up. Uh, as I read the the staff report, it looks like you were about two units short on the affordable housing requirement. I don't know if you've corrected that in this. We will. We will. We will. You, you we'll will. You're, yeah. you're planning on doing so. And, yeah. And, and if the density comes down some, and I'm, I'm, that's what I'm hearing, that you're planning on it, or staff certainly doesn't recommend a, a higher density or the density that you're proposing. So I'm, I'm hearing that you'd be working on that as well. If so, I don't know how that affects the ratio of affordable housing units, but I guess that's something that you'll be working on. Um, a staff report states, and I, I agree, uh, that the variances, the setback variances combined with the height becomes problematic. Um, that's, that's much of that's covered in, the, uh, in Mick Johnson's report as well. Um, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that you can find a way to pull back some. I heard the explanation, and I understand it. Um, the Southdale guidelines, though, look for, for greater setbacks. And I think uh, on an ownership model, that's something that I think you would want to solve for that. If, if I were going to live in one of those townhouses, I would want more separation, especially on 77th. And so pulling back there would be useful in terms of your, of your, uh, of your marketplace. Um, and, and in that way, you don't overwhelm the site uh, as well. I, I haven't heard a whole lot of discussion about uh, how you would approach the high water table in the area. Um, and I'm not seeing much in terms of the sketch itself. I'm not seeing water gardens. I don't really know exactly what the plan there is, storage, drainage. Um, I, and I, it sounds like you would address that, but do you have anything specific that you'd like to mention tonight? Well, it'll, it'll be a high, but actually two things. Let me first mention your question, and there's one point Thank I you. omitted in my presenta our presentation. It would be a combination of using blue roofs, using roof areas, using the deck area on the podium, and then on-site storage. So it would be actually a three-tier system for water management as part of it. And that base is also not all drawn in here because we sort of want to make sure the basic concept well, works. And the other thing I, we forgot to mention, the housing we're doing, affordable housing, the city requires 60% 60, 60 adjusted median income, we're shooting 80%, we're shooting for 60%. 
uh, to get it to a number that actually we think is reasonable and affordable. And that's a little bit of the push and pull with the density on this base because we don't want to just stop at 80, which really doesn't quite get there. If we can get it to 60 in the perform on this basis, that I think would really start getting at a better basis for affordability on the ownership side. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I apologize overlooked in terms of uh, presenting this. Let's, I hope you can solve for that. that that's, that's solid. Um, okay, so the, the, to come back to the water table, um, it's, it's going to be, it's a huge challenge today. It's going to be greater in the future, and that site is very definitely impacted by that. So I don't want to beat it any further, but I know that you'll come back with something last, um, almost last. The exterior design elements. Um, I would like to see something a little more dramatic uh, there. I, I, it resembles so much uh, right now of what's being built around um, this corridor as it's developing um, is going to have a fair amount of traffic. And, and I just think I, you guys are good at what you do. And I know that you can introduce some design elements into what we're seeing tonight that will create a, a sense of place a little bit more makes a little bit more of a statement about the community and the traffic that goes through here. What 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 market are you appealing to here? What do you where do you think you're to, you're going there with your market rate apartments? So you answered the question. It is going to be a market rate on the apartment side yes. with affordable ownership. Yeah, so affordable ownership market be, rate on the apartments. What market are you solving for there? So in terms of the apartments, it, yes. it'd be mid to mid upper price points. Would, uh, would you that. call that a three-star grouping moving towards three four? To or four, top? and if you, Shelly, you want to go to the other uh, views from the sure. street, because part of the things, we start playing with the architecture, and if we have one that goes from below, we started a road and stepped the corners, which okay. you probably, Four I don't know if you four. can, uh, yeah, yeah, if anyone have one that looks up at it. So where we started to play with it is stepping there, thank you, to step and carve out the corners to start creating a little more interest class. Yes. I agree in it, and that's part of the idea. You probably can't see in the small renderings of create a little more landmark nature, build really more interest to it because you're reacting to you know large square apartment blocks. So we started to play with erosion of the corners and creating sky gardens and those elements. Part of it goes with the water question that you mentioned, stormwater, and part of it goes to phasing the architecture. And that's why the podium step back, the green roof, and then carving the corners to give it more dynamic presence, and yes. this is what you're beginning to see is the start of this process, which is hard to tell in the aerial rendering, so. Yeah, so, so working with the vertical elements will give you the flexibility to create more interest. Correct. Uh, yeah, good, thank you very much. Um, and uh, so I, uh, <clears throat> part of your proposal, part of this discussion tonight is really just about Look, the development team, when, when, when you ask the city to grant uh, rezoning, variances, and amendment to the comp plan and so on, if, if, if that were to be the case, if, that, if it's possible, it creates a tremendous amount of value and, uh, for the development team. And so that's why when these things come up in terms of creating more interest, or for that matter, um, considering other elements such as passive solar, <coughs> the green roofs, excuse me, <clears throat> the green roofs that you've discussed, um, more landscaping as per McJohnson, yeah. uh, the water gardens, all of these thoughts and probably more could come forward. Um, and I'm hoping that when you come back, and I do hope you do, uh, that, that when you come back that you can introduce many of those items in there. I, I do think that the affordable ownership option here is, is very compelling. So thank you, thank oh, you thank for your you. time. And, and when we come back, that's one reason we're asking to put more also into those, to increase the number of affordable ownership. Because mm -hmm. I think that's a pattern that I'd love to replicate in Edina. The Centennial Lakes 10,000 subsidies they did was very successful with the condominiums there. Hopefully this sort of begins that transition again, tradition again. Thank you. It was done once, thank you. No rejection. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I'm gonna start with the easy ones and get to the hard ones. The easy one is we have adopted since uh, uh, Director Teague's memo, a green building policy. 
And um, so you'll, uh, hopefully you'll read that because we'll require you to um, comply with that. And um, that includes uh, green certification. Um, one thing that Mick Johnson talks about in general in our and in our Southdale guidelines is daylighting water. And I know you're talking about a green roof. Um, I hope that you'll consider some um, daylighting of water. Uh, looking at the map, and you don't need to flip to that slide, but I had a hard time figuring out how this would interact with both across the street to the north and then also to the development to the west. I hope that when you're looking at the sidewalks that you think about connecting those things because especially to the north, there's going to be a really nice path leading into the bike path. And I hope that this will echo that and you know, maybe as a city we can put a crosswalk there. Um, I'm, I'm very concerned about how you're going to get from this building to Fred Richards Park. I don't see it happening safely. Um, and then similarly, there's a big courtyard going in at the development to the west. I would like people to be able to walk over there safely, and I don't see how your sidewalks line up with their sidewalks. Yeah, and no, that's a good point. So going forward, the reason why we create the setbacks and the sidewalk, you start seeing this rendering, is to establish a pedestrian environment in the same which, as you know, today does, does not exist. As we study other developments and look at the street patterns and the street curb lines, that's where this will start to occur. So the idea is we'll bump out curbs to tie in with crosswalks to the set developments across the street. And that'll probably occur both on the west side of the project and the north side of the project as they'll set up. And that's why I saw the curb cuts in and it curves out to start making those visible connectivity along with established sidewalks and boulevards uh, as part of this area to start creating this. Because out of all the developments, this is probably the first one that actually sits on the major streets. The uh, Solomon Provost is more internal within Pentagon Office Park than it was all over. So this one is sort of the connector to the other two. And that will be definitely incorporated because it's needed. I agree with you 100% if we're going to create a neighborhood. Those connections are essential, and the street experience of walking is going to be a big part of making this work. And that's why we decided to line the base with all these townhouses, individual entries, to start creating that rhythm that gives them more comfort, context, safety, and so forth that starts to start filling out this future neighborhood. So, yes, I agree with your comments on that. So to the affordable townhomes. So I first looked at this, I was really excited. As you know, I am very, uh, affordable housing, especially ownership opportunities, is something that matters a lot to me. But I have to say, I started thinking about, well, who's gonna live here? And if I was a young parent with small children, I would be terrified to live here. Um, these yards open right onto the street. They're not safe for a two-year-old or a three-year-old to play in. If I had a seven-year-old and eight-year-old and I was tired of having them in the house, there's literally nothing on this property to go play in. They can't go swim in the pool. I don't know if there's gonna be a, a lifeguard there, but if it's January, there's no play area here whatsoever. And so as you're talking about adding more units in the back, I'm like, well, maybe you can put a basketball court back there. Maybe you can put something, but this, this kind of creeps me out as a parent, I, I'll be honest. Let me jump into and answer that question partially. What's not in here and the detail, uh, and I'll jump into it. One, we do plan to define and fence the front yard so they have a okay. sense of security and safety, which is not in rendering. Two, and if you have the rendering from above, there's a large deck area on the second floor and a large uh, amenity building that's incorporated, which would start serving that function. So that was a consideration built into that, if you see that object in the right. middle, we have right there, there that also, provides the indoor oh, play area and more each. green outdoor play area. So that is going to be built in to make it, you know, because most buildings are thinking pet friendly, we're open to make these elements also child friendly by providing indoor activities and defining and fencing the front yard. So there's a sense of security, safety, but also indoor, it's just, you're not seeing that level of detail breed in, but. Those are fair and good suggestions. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I, I would add, you know, what you're looking at in the back, I really think having a playground or a play, a playground, a basketball court or a field or all three if there's room, um, I just think 
you know, to require a kid to go across the street. And, and you can have indoor things, but, but kids need to run around and they need to make noise. And, um, and if I was a 20 something paying market rate for an apartment, how would I feel about, you know, a play area being my recreation area as well? I mean, it's nice, but sometimes kids get loud and they need to run around. So I really, if you can have some un unstructured play areas for kids, I would like this a lot better. But as it is, I have to say, I, I mean, the fences help, right? But we need to be able to get safely to Fred Richards, but not every time. Sometimes between homework and dinner, you need to fill two hours, go shoot some baskets, something like that where you can be on site, relatively close by, within earshot of your parents. Um, that, and that would take care of the activity that Mick Johnson's looking for. I think adding more homes in the back yeah. just really eats up that space. So when we've got that super density and not a big area for, for bouncy kids, it really lowers the value in my risk in my view of that affordable housing, because I, I would see that as family housing. Um, and I just would really like to see this be a family friendly um, uh, development. Okay, thank so, you. Um, yep. But, um, you know, that's, uh, it's, it's an interesting idea, and, um, and I like the fact that it takes the natural light, that again, that U shape is really nice. Um, but I would want to see this be a, a really kid-friendly development because I think that's the point of having those small um, ownership opportunities. So that's, those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, um, like the uh, corner elements that you alluded to in one of the other renderings, um, I like the uh, podium element. Um, this setback issue is interesting. Um, I'm thinking the you know the city standard uh, for MDD six is you could have gone to nine stories and then when you look at the compliance table that Member Pierce was talking about it says the uh, proposed height of seven stories meets the code requirement for height over the proposed height of the building compared to the proposed setbacks does not seem in proportion. Well, Director Teague, what would be the setback requirement at uh, seven stories? I mean, you, uh, the, uh, if there was some kind of a sliding scale. You know, so instead, because what we've done is the historically is that the taller the building gets, the more setback you have to have from the street. That's sort of been our historic model. But but over in other parts of town, we've let people move the buildings closer to the street. At 70th in France, they have a 50 foot, I think, wide sidewalk, and then and then the building. So I'm wondering if to, to remember Pierce's point. Did we miss something here with respect to the comp plan in this neighborhood that really was one that we probably never thought much about in terms of housing because it's all been light commercial industrial? Yeah, it's, it's more, I think I missed something in the table. So the comprehensive plan, the, the design experience guidelines, I'm sorry my voice is, I'm losing my voice, so sorry. Um, That's better. <laughs> but the, the, uh, the plan does talk about a 35 foot setback from the face of the building to the curb. That's, that's part of the design experience guidelines. It's 50 feet from the face of the building to the curb on France and York. But these east-west streets, what we would be looking for would be a 35-foot setback from the building to the curb. So we got a, we got a busy, the busiest street is 77th. I don't know how many cars it handles a day, but not, not the volume that France Avenue would handle. But it seems like the minimum you'd want there would be 35 as well. Then if you, if you want 35 on computer, you want 35. Yeah, 35 you know. on both these. So oh. the, other, the other kind of curiosity is parking. You know, so they're saying in the compliance table that they'd provide 239 spaces. But the code would require 331, and we've been in this conversation for uh, well over six months now about how much parking are people going to need. So I don't, I don't even know how to address that issue that we're they're out of compliance with the compliance table because that's the same sort of standard we'd imposed for Southdale Mall. Yeah, a variance for the parking um, is, is pretty standard these days with our, with our residential um, projects. As part of this study, a, a traffic and parking study would be done. 
um, to determine if they are providing enough, enough parking spaces. But just comparing this to other residential projects, that's probably um, going to meet that standard. Yeah. And then I, re I remember when we did a few years ago, maybe it was 08 or 09, uh, we did that uh, urban environmental impact statement. What was, and it had an acronym. Yeah, the AUAR. AUAR. And the AUAR, as I recall, showed that the sewer, sewer capacity in that part of town was not good because Bloomington was using all of the sewer capacity with projects that they had across 494. So does this building or more uh, uh, housing create a potential problem for us and how do we solve it? Because I think, you know, we've, we've, we've thought that we wanted to get that problem dealt with because we don't want to, we don't want to stop development because we don't have the capacity to handle the sewage. Yeah, I think in this area, we're okay. Um, that problem has been solved to the south in Bloomington. With the next sketch plan that we're gonna discuss, we do have an issue with that one. Oh, but with, with this but project, this one. but not this one. But so that, that a, the problem the AUAR revealed has been solved. Correct, yeah. Okay, in fact, that's good news, Yeah, that's good news. All right. Um, well, it's a, it's a vast potential improvement over what's there now. <laughs> Thank and you. I get to uh, Member Henderson's point. Uh, you got this high water table over there, to deal with, over there to deal with. I understand why you want your parking at grade or above. That makes a lot of sense. But I'm also eager to hear about stormwater management. And uh, I know you, you, you dealt with that over at 7250 France uh, when that looked like it was going to be a viable project. It didn't turn out to be a viable project. but. I expect you guys will come up with some creative engineering ideas on this as well. Um, I don't have much more to add. Member Pierce has, this has caused him to think of something else he wants to talk about. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just wanted to um, just circle back to be sure when you do come back, is it clear um, what, you, what changes you think you need to make? And so I'm just gonna go back to I think your proposed setbacks and the, the uh, explanations that you gave for setting um, the appropriate environment around the development, that makes sense to me. But what I don't wanna do is do amendments for this, and then we'd have to do amendments for everything else that's built after that. Um, because the development pad the way the comprehensive plan is outlined doesn't support this. And so when I talk about, um, I'm looking at the comprehensive plan, that's what I'm talking about. So this development in the way that you're proposing the setbacks, I, I think it, it's, it, it works, but it doesn't fit with the plan that we have. And so that's my question. And then when Director Teague, when you talked about, you know, the setback could be 35, I, then I get confused. Then I, I wanna throw up my hands and say, all right, do we have a structured plan with guidelines or do we or don't we? Uh, because again, I, what I don't wanna do is the next development that comes in, we're gonna have to have the same conversation about the, we're have, gonna have to amend the plan um, in order to approve it. And so I think we really should be looking at what do we want in the comprehensive plan? We should, we should start there, in my opinion, as opposed to having the developer go back with this feedback. Because if you come back again and the setbacks are the same, I'm gonna ask the same question. <laughs> Right, and I, I just don't think that's not fair to you. Yeah, no, and and, and there's a conflict right. between mixed vision yeah. and the comp plan, and mixed vision is it's, it's what we lean towards. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I get that. I totally yeah. get that. So, so that's, yeah. that's what I'm asking for us to figure out how we want to rationalize. Yeah. So to be, to be clear, 35 feet is the setback from the building to the street. That's code and the comprehensive plan. 
the density, the maximum density that's allowed here, what they're proposing is not consistent with the comprehensive plan. So that would take an amendment. Um, they're proposing, <clears throat> if they were to add units on the back, that's even above the 189. Um, um, so 75 units per acre is the comprehensive plan. This is gonna be somewhere in that 80 to 85 units per acre. So, so are, are you saying then that the compliance table is wrong? Yes. Okay, now that's the second or third time that that's been the case. Uh, so I, right? We, yeah, we, we, I think so. Gotta be honest, right? That's the second, the second or third time that that's been the case. And that's just, that's not acceptable. Mm -hmm. Right, so we got to fix that when we're looking at um, these sketch plans because it's just fair to the developer <laughs> that the information that we're representing is, is accurate, right? Just it's calling it the way it is, right? Um, so I would ask um, for our sake that we update the compliance table with the correct data. Um, between now and the next time the developer comes back. But I think what Director Teague is saying that he can do that, but the dwelling units per acre number for sure is a problem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. But but the, the question then is, uh, I, and what I heard you saying, uh, Member Pierce, was uh, we should probably look at this whole neighborhood and see Maybe it was an afterthought when the comp plan was done because we didn't envision this kind of use over there. So we we might have to revise the comp plan, but to have it affect a broader neighbors who are not doing it on a one-off basis. Yep, you're 100. percent That's what yep. I'm saying. Yeah, and and that's exactly what happened over in the Southdale district a few years ago, before you guys run the council. Is that we took? It seemed like the comp plan worked for about five years on the last comp plan, and then. Property got more expensive, land got more expensive, and then we had to go back to the uh, to the Met Council several times to amend the comp plan to allow increased density because of the price of the land. And now here we are, we're barely two years into this comp plan and we're already facing the same issue that we faced in the last comp plan, but faster. So I, I think it's a great idea to take a look at this whole neighborhood and see what we want to do about it. We did look at this whole neighborhood when we updated the comp plan a year ago. We did? Yeah, 75 yeah. units an acre. Anticipating this, things like this? Yeah. I don't remember yes. that part of it, yeah. Okay. We did. So, All right, well then. Mr. Mayor, oh, I'm sorry, M Member Pierce. <laughs> that, so we looked at the comp plan before. And it, I'm just gonna say it this way, it feels again like I'm asking questions and there's already some answers out there. And so it, it, sitting here, it, it causes an issue of whether or not I can trust what's in the comp plan, right? So if, if we looked at it, so I'm interpreting that to mean we've thought about the area we figured out how we want the development paths to be, uh, and the compliance table just happens to be wrong. We can go correct that, but we already have a comprehensive plan, and we know how we want those development paths to be set. And if that's the case, I should be able, we should all be able to take that, the developer should be able to take that, and when they come in, they should already know what issues they're gonna have and then talk through how they think they can address those. But this feels like a moving target to me. And it's confusing to me personally uh, because it, it feels like it's a moving target. And I don't know how to, to get to resolution with that. Director Teague, did you have a comment? Well, it, so this is a sketch plan. So this is, um, you know, supposed to be an open discussion, dialogue. We don't have sp a specific detailed proposal. Um, so for what that's worth, the, the biggest ask here is that comprehensive plan amendment. 
when the plans first came in and I noticed it exceeded our density requirements, I brought that to their attention and they had indicated to me that they would be in compliance. So I thought that was kind of a done issue. Um, but now they're saying that they, they do want to proceed, potentially get feedback from the council as to whether you think a comp plan amendment would be acceptable. But again, we did spend you know two plus years um, doing that comprehensive plan amendment and densities were a big part of that. And 75 units an acre, what was decided for this area and all of west of France. Member Jackson. Are you finished? Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, this has prompted a lot of thoughts on my part. A couple of things. Um, First of all, I would not be in favor of a comprehensive plan amendment on the density. Um, I want to make that clear. Um, the second thing is, I think what would be helpful, Director Teague, is, and this is confusing to the public as well, I think the way this works, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that we have a zoning code that is, they don't have to get a variance or anything, so if, if, if it complied 100% with our existing zoning code, it would be built and no, you know, it would just be permitted and boom. What our comprehensive plan does, and, and when they presented the Southdale area plan, is this is the beginning of a conversation. So if, if they don't want to build, you know, with the 87 foot setback and all the things that are in this chart, there is a second chart that needs to be included, uh, Director Teague. I think it would be really helpful that's compliant with the Southdale uh, small area plan. And that has, that's where the 35 foot setback is and stuff. And I think that would be hugely helpful, not only for us, but also for the public um, to include that information. And so, but when we do that, that's through a, a planned unit development. And when we do the planned unit development, then we have, uh, then our policies kick in, like the, the affordable housing policy and the green building policy. And I think that that's not clear in, in this. And I think that a lot of the, um, Com uh, comments we get in public hearings are reflected in that. So it would be helpful to me to see the standards for a PUD in the comp plan um, when we look at these types of charts. Um, because it, it is a it does seem like a huge gap, but I know there's something else out there and, and I'd like to have that information included, if we could please. I can sure do that. Okay, thank you, but um, yeah. You I, meant it wasn't clear in the comp plan, not in this presentation. I mean, um, they're, no, they're, it's they're, clear. I think it's clear in the comp plan when we do a PUD according to the Southdale area plans what the expectations are, and that's what Mick Johnson bases his comments on when he looks great. at this. Um, but it's not in this table. No, because but it does say at the bottom of the table that they're going to go PUD. Right, but there so are some standards. Yeah, exactly. there are standards for a PUD, but also, and what it, what is. Um, good and complicated about the Southdale area plan is that the PUD is a conversation and that's what um, uh, Michael um, Schrader had in mind when he presented is that we wanted to have these conversations and that was by design. Um, but it would be useful to get those um, Southdale area plans so that we have, a, a, have those numbers in front of us. That'd be really helpful. Yeah, so. those are excellent comments. I can make some changes. It's it's more about this sketch plan. You know, how much detail do we need? Right, right, and and that. that again. But we can say what our standards are, yep. and and then the sketch plan is. And and you guys <laughs> were taking your time to have this conversation, but uh, you know, to me, a comprehensive plan change is a huge deal because. I was in on a lot of those conversations, and it was a lot of work. And I don't want to go monkeying with this if we don't have to, because um, it's. Um, it, I want to respect the work that was done, but I also want to publicize the work that was done. Um, so those are my comments. Thanks. The, the the challenge of saying you don't want to monkey with this if you don't have to is that all of those standards were set with the best wisdom at the time a couple of years ago. And uh, how do we know this isn't just the first of many to come where they're going to say, uh, we can't make it at 75 dwelling units per acre. Does that mean that we don't ever develop that part of town because nobody can meet that standard? 
No. I'm, not, I'm raising this rhetorically, not with right, you. Right, 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 right. Or do we, do we, because I've been through several of these comp plan amendments. Yeah, they're not easy, but they get done. And every one of them has been approved because the Met Council likes more density. Okay. And I think, you know, what I'd like to know is, as I think, and this is what Member Pierce is getting at, some standards for how do we make those decisions? Um, you know, what, what does the developer need to show us that it's not um, viable? At that, or, or what? What kind of data do we need as a city council to make that decision? Because, like I said, I sat in on those endless meetings um, uh, to, to design that comp plan, and I'm really reluctant to set any of it aside without something really hard and constructive that I can I can um, depend that on. Um, and uh, and I'd like it to be policy based if possible. But sure. you know, I I think we need to have some guidelines for when that's okay, because yeah, of course, the future changes and look at what COVID has done to the price of everything. But, um, but I do wanna, I, I don't want it to be one off every time because that then, then the predictability is gone. That's what's the best part of the comp plan. Well, I think that's the, that's the question. I'm gonna go to Member Stott in a second, but is the comp plan a standard or is it a 50,000 foot view where you're telling, you think your town's gonna be over the next 10 years? For me, it's always been the, it's not the 10 commandments, for me, it's always been just a guide. That's why they call it a guide. And so, because things change, and they now they change exponentially. Right. So, I mean, I don't know what I think either, but I'm just saying that I don't want to leave good projects on the cutting room floor because it says 75 dwelling units per acre and not, and they, and they want 80. You right. know. Well, really, in the scheme of things, what's the difference? Right. And, and I'm I not guess saying that I would favor this. But I'm telling you about the broader implications of the, of the comp plan, using it as a standard instead of a guide. I think it sets community expectations. And so the, the, the lodestone for me would be, how far is this off what the community is expecting based on what we told them? If it's a 180 degree change, that's really bad. If it's incremental, then we can say, look, we said we were gonna have apartments here, we're gonna have apartments here. You know, it just isn't viable at that level. So I think I would base it on what community expectation is because this is an uneasy alliance. There are a lot of people in the community who are really worried about the pace of change. And, you know, they, their voices were part of, of, of this, this compromise. So I think it's, it's how far off the expectations are we getting with the change. Those, those are the, the same issues we faced in 2008 that, where that comp plan that ran for 10 years and if my memory serves me right, by the time we got to the five-year mark, some of those projects over in Southdale District were almost at 100 dwelling units per acre, and the standard was like 50. Yeah. So that is a no more than an incremental change. Yeah. Well, I think. But it's something I, that you need to kind of wrestle through. But yeah. I'm going to I, I'd love to get your um, the, your history on that um, yeah. memorialized. Member Stott. So there's a terrific project right across the street that we just approved and it complies. So I don't understand why we can't comply. It's a fabulous project across the street. We all loved it and it's gonna be great and this yeah. one can't, Point. so why not? The safe road is to comply. <laughs> Got so it, that's the last word from tonight. But I, but I enjoyed the debate. <laughs> It wasn't a debate, it was just kind of a discussion. <laughs> and we have to have those here because we can't have them in private because that's against the open meetings law. So. Okay, thanks you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I would, I would echo what Member Stanton said is that the Solheim project across the street is the, I'd say that's the new gold standard. So let's see if they can put up a new gold standard over on 169 and Bren Road. Over in Member Staunton's new neighborhood. So as they're coming up, I could give a little introduction here. Uh, so this one is located out on Lincoln, Lincoln Drive and Londonderry, right on the west 
border of the city on 169. They're proposing a four to five story, 195 unit apartment. This site is guided uh, for office residential. It is compliant with the density. Uh, again, this is an area of 75 units an acre. 10% uh, of the units within the project would be for affordable housing. As I mentioned earlier, it, in this area of town, we do have a sewer capacity issue. Um, so today, we couldn't build this project. There's, there's not capacity. Um, so it's something that engineering is um, studying, and we hope to have some cost estimates within the next couple of months. Um, but again, it is consistent with the comprehensive plan we have um, considered this for, for a housing area. So with that, I will introduce uh, Mr. Solom and the development team, and they'll present the details. Thank you, Director Teague. Gentlemen, welcome. Would you please identify yourselves for the record, and we'll get that done before you make your presentation. You bet. Good evening. I'm Kirk Gunsbury from Solheim Companies. Good evening. Jason Lark, Solheim Company. And Craig Hartman, owner and design group. Gentlemen, thank you, welcome. Thank you. All right, so. Uh, Go ahead, we're eager to hear about 5780 we, we Lincoln Drive. Yeah, we were the gold standard, so um, we kind of set a high bar for ourselves. I'm, I'm smiling, I'm joking. Um, so good evening and thanks for having us, you guys. Um, it's really late, we get that, and I'm just really grateful for such a civil conversation in Edina. It's just wonderful to hear you guys talk about it so thoughtfully. So. Hopefully we can have a similar conversation about this project we're proposing and get really great feedback from you like we have in the past, so thank you. Um, oh, and by the way, um, the project uh, in Pentagon Park has, uh, demolition has begun. It is underway and uh, hopefully you'll see really exciting things happening there soon, so, so thank you for your support. Um, let's see, so we are Solhem and MDG, uh, Momentum Design Group, and um, different location we're talking about today, London Dairy and 169. Uh, if you're not familiar, that's West Edina. Very different demographics in the neighborhood. Um, we're really adding part of what I'd say is a continuum of housing to the neighborhood that doesn't fully exist right now. There are, there's a similar building just to the south, but not very much multifamily housing in this area of the city. Um, for us, it's different location, but very similar goals. Uh, we're looking at uh, housing that's uh, going to follow all the guidelines uh, like we've discussed before. It will be within a PUD. Um, it's 195 units, so just think of it as 200 in round numbers. And uh, we're looking at doing 10% of it at 50% of AMI for the affordable. Um, Jason is going to take it from here. My voice is actually fading too like Carrie's. So uh, Jason's going to take it from here with all the descriptions of uh, the projects, and then Craig's going to present all the architectural. And I'm going to take a seat and just watch, all right? So, oh, and I just want to say thank you again, um, council members Pierce, Staunton, Anderson, Jackson. Really appreciate being here, and Mayor Hovland for your guidance on all this stuff. We're grateful for it. Right. Thank you, Mr. Gunsbury. Hey, good evening, Mayor and council members. And as, as Kurt said with this project, we, while it's a very different site, um, we really wanted to take some of the design philosophies that we had um, with the Pentagon Park project and apply them here. and. We really looked at the unique topography and the situation of the site. So Londonary slopes almost two stories, and we have the entrance ramp to 169, and the site's um, twisted a little bit as a parallelogram. But not only that, we have a, a really important intersection where the Nine Mile Creek Trail that's proposed to be extended, but right now it kind of ends at that intersection. And then there's also a commercial space across that intersection. So we've got many different constraints on this site that I think could be really turned into opportunities with this project where you know, we do have some pedestrian um, commercial activity going on that intersection. I think it's really important to, to support that and make that a walkable intersection. I think it's also, there is a, a bus stop there on Londonderry and, and I think the bike path as well to really have you know, a marker. It's one of the first, if the trail gets extended to Minnetonka, which there's a plan um, down Lincoln Drive, where it would go through the wetland and under 169, you know, this would be the first intersection that you'd really get to any Dyna from the Nine Mile Creek Trail. So we realized the importance of that and really wanted to design the building so we have our common area activating that intersection so that we get eyes on the street, we build a public realm and streetscape. And then the rest of the building with the highway around it 
We really wanted to integrate it and nestle it into the landscape so we could use a lot of the natural barriers between our building and some of the, the entry driveways and other aspects. So that's the broad philosophy of the project and then Craig will focus more on uh, a lot of the details. Thanks, Jason. You know, I'll be brief tonight. So I wanted to just start by talking about the site in general, you know, kind of from a, from a macro level uh, down to a, a smaller level. You know, when we first looked at the site, um, you know, we see this site as an ideal spot for high density residential. You know, we've got the busyness of Highway 169 to our west. We've got Lincoln Drive then to our east, the natural buffer that Nine Mile Creek provides us. And then we transition to a medium density residential to the east, and then obviously further to the east, we get into low, low density residential. So we felt like this is a, this is a great spot for this use. And you know, we, we would become that buffer uh, adjacent to the busyness of 169. I think the other thought that we had was you know, the idea that while, while 169 creates some challenges for us that, that we can certainly overcome, it's, it's also the idea that you know, any traffic that our development generates you know, takes advantage of that adjacency. Uh, we are not circulating through lower density neighborhoods. Um, we are not contributing you know, traffic to, to, to our adjacent neighbors. Um, that adjacency helps us in that case. I think moving down to the site level now, you know, a couple of things struck, struck me when I visited for the first time. You know, is, Number one, the, you know, the topography that Jason mentioned, you know, it's, it's a challenge. Um, and it's something that we're looking at very, very carefully. I think the other piece was the fact that while there's an existing building there, you know, it's an office building, it's got parking, it's, it's very much a void. There's, you know, it's, it's lower because of that topography we talked about. So it sits low. Um, if, if you weren't looking for it, you'd miss it. And it's, and it's really a void. There's, there's no connection to Londonderry. In fact, there's a couple of retaining walls you know, that you walk along, along, Lon along Londonderry there. And so that was, that was one of some of the key pieces that we, that we first looked at then in siting the building. Not only siting it from an from a east, west, north, south standpoint, but also from an elevation standpoint. It was very important. From, from the very beginning to, to basically get a presence on Londonderry. And that means pulling the building up a little bit, filling in some of that grade to get a front door on Londonderry. And so we've done that with this, with this plan. Um, it gives us a great presence on Londonderry. Um, it, it provides that connection that we're looking for, not only to the, to the regional trail system in front of us, but also to the amenities in our, in our area. Um, and that was, a, that was a key component for us. So we've got our common area located in kind of that southeast corner of the building. As we transition around, around that area, um, you know, we also get into, uh, well, let me back up a second. I wanna actually talk about some of the other sort of decisions we made in siting the building. We talked about the elevation. Uh, that was one piece. I think the other pieces we looked at was how do we manage our bulk and how do we manage our FAR? And I, and I truly want to stress the idea of managing. What we've done here is we've, we've looked at the idea of A, shifting the building to the west. Um, not as far as we can go, uh, but we have. We've biased the building to the west side. That provides a larger natural buffer to, between us and Lincoln Drive to the east. Um, but, but also the, you know, the various volumes that we've got in the building and just how the building, how the building takes shape. You know, it's the idea that if we placed a U-shaped building on this site, a U-shaped, C-shaped, kind of however you want to look at it, you end up with a very long wall and then you turn 90 degrees and you've got another very long wall and it just <laughs> creates a tremendous amount of bulk or at least perceived bulk. Here what we've done is we've taken a look at sort of these, these east-west wings that are kind of on the north and the south ends of the building. Those are the wings that sort of, that, that reach out towards Lincoln Drive, reach out toward our closest neighbors, frankly, and we've tried to minimize that impact as much as possible. Uh, I think then the north-south connector 
um, you know, kind of snakes through there. What we're doing is we're really, we're really focusing on the idea of, frankly, the idea that these are homes. <coughs> and we're really focusing on the idea of, of air, light. Pause for a second. So the, the way that this is laid out on the screen is the, the plan north is different. So they need to know that. Cause north is to the right. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, thank you. But it's the idea that we've really taken a look at and tried to focus on the idea of air, light, and unobstructed views for as many of these <clears> as we can. <throat> and I think related to that, just adding what Craig said, it, it's really I wouldn't in a the shadow city here. And we also thought a way to break up the topography is, is this building will present almost as four separate buildings as you rotate around the site. So it's really important. How do we turn the corner um, and make it look like a collection of four buildings that are connected in the middle so that they could each have their presence on each other? You know, and I think moving now into sort of how do, how do people interact with the building? I mean, after all, that's, that's what this is all about. You know, first from, from the pedestrian standpoint, we talked about the front door. You know, we won't rehash that. It's the idea of the presence on Londonderry. Sort of as we shift around, as we shift around to sort of that, that corner on Londonderry, the, the intersection of Londonderry and Lincoln, you know, we see that, that landscaped area as, as gardens, as a plaza. You know, admittedly, we're very early on in the process, but but it's the idea that we want that space outside of our common areas to sort of be this, this shared amenity. You know, it's amenity for our residents, but it's also an amenity for the public. And it's an amenity that, that people using the trail can take advantage of. You know, we want that to be shared and open and welcoming and engaging with the public. Admittedly, if, if, if we've got someone walking along that sidewalk and, and they, they're not sure if they should be in that area or not, then that's a failure on my part. You know, it's it's the idea that we want to make sure that this is open, open, and it's clearly defined that that this is public space, and uh, and it's and it can be shared. As we move then around the corner, you know, our common area we talked about with the topography, it it, it actually transitions from a single story down to a two story element, and that's where we get to our lower entrance, which would be facing north. Um, that's our vehicular drop-off area. You know, obviously all the functions that a building like this needs to, needs to take on. None of that happens in the right-of-way, of course. It's all planned for in this area. I think finally, as we mentioned, we are early in the process. So I wanted to just talk about exterior design a little bit. And I think, you know, right now, um, you know, we know this is four-sided design. There is no rear to the building in this. It's it's a you know a unique site in that standpoint. Um, the brick or the, the exterior is scheduled to be predominantly brick, uh, but it's it's really going to be an over, overall uh, a very natural palette. Um, I think we've we've worked hard to set up this building such that it's it's nestled into this to topography. It's, it's embracing that topography, it's embracing the natural features around it, and we'd love to see the exterior of the building be you know, sort of an, an earthy masonry, uh, stone accents, um, potentially some timber detailing and some warm wood tones, things like that. Basically a natural palette um, is what we see for this, so. And, and with that relating a lot to the, some of the sustainability features, I think you know, we're looking and measuring which you know, large growth 24 inch trees we have on site and can we design to incorporate those, you know, pines, 100 year old pines in this main common area. Um, you know, maybe do some lands, uh, daylighting of stormwater like we're doing at the Pentagon Park site if we could find space for it, blue roofs as well to really integrate those, a dog walk around the site as well. We did hear um, some comments, uh, we had some good feedback from the Planning Commission um, a few weeks ago and one of the comments that has not been adjusted yet in this plan is on the sidewalk in this front pedestrian area to use that landscape as a buffer off Lincoln Drive and pull that sidewalk in. And as Craig said, mm -hmm. we're still developing and working through that corner as well. But that, I know it's late, so I'll open it to, to any uh, questions or comments. Thank you for your time. Yes, yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Um, Member Stanton, you want to go first this time? 
Yeah, I just have a question on the trail. Can you point out to us where the where the trail is and where it's intended to go? And because I know right now it's going across Londonderry Drive and across 169, and that's the way you get to Hopkins. What's the yeah. other? What's the path that's ultimately right, intended? Right now, it's. If, I don't know if you can see the mouse cursor, but it's this brown line here that, that would actually go down Lincoln Drive, um, and there is a cul-de-sac at the end of Lincoln Drive. Right. And there's a fully um, engineered plan. I believe it's still looking for funding or not. Oh, sorry. Um, no, you just, grabbing. there's a hand mic right on the desk there. Oh, all right. Use that. Council Member Stoughton, I can answer that trail yeah. question. That'd so Lincoln, we, we installed the Lincoln sidewalk to Dover. Three Rivers Park District this winter is connecting the rest of it from Dover to the cul-de-sac going along Nine Mile Creek, and when they did the 169 project, there's already a tunnel underneath. Sweet. So they're just gonna make the connection so you don't have to go over the Bren Bridge with the trail mm -hmm. connection. So, so this would be, so your, your Lincoln Drive face will be fronting on the trail. Correct. Yep, Correct. the trail will wow. across All the street. all over again. You found another part of the trail. Yeah. How about it? <laughs> Just then, the other end of it. Exactly. And the tunnel will be right about where the 9 is in this image of 169. Yeah. Right down there through yep. the wetlands. So I think it, it'll really be a beautiful trail when it's completed. All right. So, want me to start? Yeah, go ahead, please. So I happen to be a neighbor right now. I live in the other high-density residential building in the neighborhood. And uh, and this would be a comprehensive plan change, but it strikes me that unlike the last comprehensive plan change we're talking about, this one has some justification because some things have happened that have changed since we adopted the last comp plan, which is COVID and the whole office use and the rest. And And I think this is a really promising use. And if you think about the medium density to the east, it would probably benefit from the buffering that you would create by your building from the noise mm -hmm. of 169. And then the trail is just a great amenity to spill out onto. And you've really kind of got an easy on and off to 169 either direction, which would make it really attractive to folks. So I, I think there's a lot promising to this. and. And also, um, as you heard earlier, a great admirer of the work that you did at the other end of the trail. So um, I think there's a lot of good things to think about here. And, and I like also the way you're thinking about the articulation of the building. It sounds like you're in mid-concept on that and still mm -hmm. tinkering with it. But it is, uh, you know, the building I live in is a classic horseshoe. Um, and it does create long walls that are that are challenges. So I like what you're what you're thinking about here, and then the mix and and the height seem all to be in the mix. So I'm I'm uh, I'm really I'm impressed. I think it had worked. The one thing, if if we are thinking about comprehensive plan changes, is what it means for this stuff to the north, which is more industrial or light industrial, or is that office or, or warehouse too. Sure. Warehouse, you know, and I we'd have to kind of think about that a little bit. Um, but the interface with the trail and making starting to create because I'll tell you, as somebody who uses that, it's going to be a huge improvement to have the trail go up Lincoln instead of across Londonderry and across the bridge, yeah, just right. as the usability. And then to make that, again, an amenity for that building and vice versa, have that building kind of help frame that will be really nice. So I'm excited about it. Thank you. Member Anderson. Thank you. Um, I like your design. It's, it's a sprawling building, however, mm -hmm. and you're going a little higher, obviously, than we want to see there. The Loden, I think, is four stories. Yeah, and this would be five. Um, I when I, when I look at the building and I, I look at the at the setbacks, I think okay, well we're we're putting a lot in here. We're going wide, and there isn't much room to negotiate. Um, and I have a question as well for either uh, Director 
Teague or Director Milner, the sewer um, and the, the sewage service there, how profound of an issue is that? How correctable is it? And at what kind of expense and what kind of timeline would we look at there? If it would be helpful, I could bring up a graphic and explain the situation a little bit. Maybe that'd be helpful. But basically, this drains into the industrial area, the Cahill area that Mr. Teague just started a small area plan. And from there, it goes over to Richfield. So we already have a major issue from 100 over to Richfield that we know is between 10 and $20 million. And uh, former finance director Don Earlham is working on the numbers of how we can do that portion. So I'd say the south portion from the industrial to there. This follows the Nine Mile Creek all the way from this proposed development into the industrial park. So I don't have a number there because we looked at capacities and we could support the loading, we could support Edina High School expansion, yeah. the 70, 75 admins in site, and one property that's in Bloomington that had thoughts about developing. So we could support that. I recently had the, our consultant check the flows with Met Council. Our model's right on to what we're seeing. So there's no fluff in those numbers. So now I've asked them to put a proposal together to look at this north segment and let's see what it costs to bring it up to support not only this one, but some of the other properties that Member Stoughton just mentioned to the, to the north of this one. Yes. So that'll happen in the next few months. Then it's a discussion about how do we pay for it and all those kind of discussions. But So if, it, if you were speculating about a timeline to try to come forward with a solution and when that could be completed to enable a project like this on that site, would that be a year and a half, a year, two years? It would be two years for both these segments, two yeah. to three years, which would time potentially pretty well with theirs, right? They got a, usually a two-year build, and they're not maxed out right at door opening. So there's a, a kind of a timing there. If we do the projects, we start to pick out the pieces that have to happen immediately and build those over two years. So I think in the next two to three years, uh, we'd like to not have to say no because of sewer issues. So that's what we're looking at right now. Thank you. Um, that's, a, that's, that's an answer which is also kind of a start here. Um, Member Staunton discussed the, the, the area and then to the north. And I, I was, it was very interesting to watch uh, Commissioner Miranda's uh, discussion the other night about what is it that we really want to do here. Do we, wanna, do we wanna say we're gonna extend residential to the north? Is that what we're doing? And then how much the sewer capacity there and how much is that gonna require? And if we did, how would we create um, better, a better pedestrian use in here? How would we, how would we get around in through here? Um, one of the things I noticed, and you, you, you touched base on the sidewalk on the, sure. on the front. Um, so in general, this is, I, I think we've got a sewer problem that we're gonna to have to resolve here to see um, how is this gonna work and can we do this? Then the second is, it's, it, it, it's a lot of building on that site the way that it currently sits. I would like to see that get pulled back some. I would like to see, you know, we, you have some side yard or some, set, some setback requirements that we're gonna to have to work around. Those would require variances. Um, and the height of the building, obviously, is also going to require more work on that and another concession. And then, again, we have the comp plan amendment to consider. So that's a, that's a whole lot of work to do here on a building that, that um, is quite attractive and could fit in very well. And you're probably right. Some density in that area is a good idea. The other side of that coin, though, however, is most of the density in the area is on the other side of 169. There, there's your dense area. And so this area at this time hasn't featured this kind of density. And I think basically it's because of the industrial use as well as the adjoining low density uh, residential housing that's, that's throughout the area. Mm -hmm. So for me anyway, I'd like to really get clarity on the on our the ability to provide service to build a building like this and then if that can work out and if you were to come back i would very much decide, like to see this pulled back some and to allow uh, some flow in here and especially flow into the residential areas um, and then considering 
what we do and go far uh, uh, on the north side. I would love your design though. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And, and Member Anderson, if you don't mind, you know, I would just suggest that, you know, while it's completely accurate that we would be considered a five-story building from Londonderry and in really the south half of the building, we have four stories exposed. So from Londonderry and from the intersection of like Londonderry and the on-ramp, um, Londonderry to Lincoln, as our grade steps down, we do expose that, that extra story. So you have great issues there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I get it. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Member Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So first, uh, Director Teague, does this require a comprehensive plan change? This would not. <clears throat> no, it, okay. it's, it's guided for office residential use in okay. this area. Thank you for that clarification. So I love this. I have to tell you, I walk by this corner five, <laughs> six, seven, eight times a week. This is my neighborhood. I walk it well. I love this. <laughs> I just am so excited about it. When you said light and air, you had me. I'll, I'll be honest. Um, I think this is a, a infinitely better um, use of the land than what's there now. It is a strange, awkward piece of land, and it you've is. made it beautiful. Um, I love this. I want to tell you some about the neighborhood. Um, so don't worry about connecting to the properties to the south because as you know there's a creek there you cannot connect to them so the where this on this picture the the crosswalk is that's the crosswalk and um you know there's not going to be there's trees and there's a, a creek it's not and and there's a huge it's a double path and you've been to the site yeah. Oh, yeah. there is a a extra wide sidewalk and a bike trail in the street. So you literally have four lanes of bike traffic on the other side of the street. Don't waste time on the sidewalk. I mean, you, you probably want to put a sidewalk in there. On, um, and I, it, on Lincoln, there are mature crab apple trees that are really pretty. Yes. And I would much rather save those crab apple trees than put a boulevard on the sidewalk. It's mm. really a waste of land to put a boulevard there and destroy those trees. Okay. Um, yeah. they're, they're, if you can save them, that would be great because they really are beautiful. Yeah. Um, the site to your south has a funny accessibility. So on the corner of Londonderry and Lincoln, you cannot get to the, to the car caribou from that corner. You have to go all the way in. It's kind of it's a it's funny, kind of yeah, it's got yeah. that retaining wall. You can't really climb up. But I believe on the west side, you can see a little bit of the sidewalk there. You can access, access that mall by that sidewalk. So when you're planning this, think about um, people will want to go across the street and get coffee. Mm -hmm. And so if you have your sidewalk set up so that that's easy to do, um, you'll save some frustration for your residents um, coming forward. Um, so where that sidewalk is coming out, I mean, that's nice to have it come into the um, Londonderry Street. It really leads kind of to nowhere. Um, on that community room in the corner, if there was a way for you to have a juice bar there that's open to the public, you would probably do land office business. There are a lot of bikers who come through there, and if you had you know, a $5 glass of lemonade available for the public, they would make money. Um, you, know, you know, a fancy lemonade stand, essentially. <laughs> um, and I know we talk about activating and everything, so I don't know if that works in your plans. It would have to be totally accessible by um, bike and, and pedestrian, yeah, probably. Right. I don't think mm -hmm. you're going to be able to get parking for a restaurant. Um, but if you had that, they would do good business. So this is probably the closest anybody in Edina is to the new Green Line um, light rail. Exactly. So when you're designing this, and I don't know exactly where that stop is, um, you'll want to be able to make it easy, you know, or keep in your mind where the stop is and how you're going to get there. Sure. And you, you're nodding sure. your head. You've looked at this. I've, I've walked it there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The station's yeah. in. Yeah. Already. And then, um, you know, this used to be an express bus lane, um, yeah. a bus service, and it's been canceled. Um, I kind of have, because I was really surprised. I'm like, there's a bus stop there, but it's not active. Um, so that's kind of, you know, maybe this will bring it back yeah, and stuff. Right. But, but. Um, so you have a marketing thing that this is Edina's closest spot to the, the green line. Um, to the north, um, 
at the next exit off of 169, at the Lincoln exit, um, there are two apartment buildings that are very close to the highway, and you're nodding. You've seen this, too. There's a sound wall there. I, I think it's probably ugly, and it may, it's not in your plans, but just know that that's an option um, for your building, and you might want to just check it out and see if that's something you agree with. Sure. But there's a, a really um, close one, and then there's one that's off a little bit um, from the highway, but they do have a sound wall. Okay. Um, so, yeah, saving those crabapple trees, uh, the connectivity to the, the airy things, and I'm so pleased to hear, um, Director Milner, that we're going to get that bike trail through there. That's great news, because we go down and visit the hole under the highway. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, I really like this plan. I love light and air. Um, you know, the, the, obviously the same things with the green building policy and the, and the affordable housing policy will apply if you do a PUD. Um, but, but thank you. This will bring a lot of life to the neighborhood. So. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to turn to Member Pierce, but I, I really am having a hard time figuring out whether Member Jackson is more excited about the climate action plan or the London Dairy Apartments. <laughs> it's maybe a toss-up, but she is rolling it's, tonight. It's kind of the same thing, you know. <laughs> this is what we envision. Oh, Member thank, Pierce. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Um, so the first question, is this compliance table accurate? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, this area I like a lot. I'm over there all the time. Um, and so I do like what I'm envisioning. When you're over there, the building, there's a lot of greenery there. There's mm -hmm. trees. Um, you don't really see the industrial park unless you drive back there. Yes. Um, and so um, if your design, and this is what you said, is that you're... You've de you're designing the building along with the topography to kind of fit in with the space. Um, and so I, I do like that as a concept. Um, I don't, I, I don't see how this is very different from the other sketch, the discussion that we had before. Um, and so I just want to say that um, the compliance table is accurate and so the it doesn't meet the zoning standards in a number of cases um and and so what i would ask is and i'll use what you said as an example um even though the loading is a it's a big building when i drive through there it doesn't really feel that that mm -hmm. tall to me because i think because of the way it's designed and it's set back. Um, I think this, if it's the same height as the low, and then yours is actually taller in certain areas. And so I'm, I'm going to get to my suggestion to you. Um, this would feel more overbearing on the street. It just will because it's, it's so close to the street. Um, and so I think it would be helpful if you're able to um, um, articulate uh, or, or show um, in your, your design what you were describing, that you're four feet and then, or you're four stories, mm -hmm. and then you're, you know, you've got a little terrain to deal with, and so at a certain point you're at five, right? And so I think it's, I think I can see that. Um, but it would be good to, to be able to really help us understand uh, what the relationship will be on the sidewalk and the street to the front and the, or to the, I think it would yeah, be the front and the side of the building. So Londonderry. Londonderry and Lincoln. And Lincoln. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, as I mentioned, um, you, if you are uh, going to meet the density, um, and we got the sewer capacity, which we talked about, um, the height, right, is an issue. And what I try to do, um, and you, you've all heard me say this, like I want to be able to to make a trade off. So in this case, if a trade off is, well, this building is going to be closer to the light rail. Right then, you can you can say to the residents, "Yep, 
this building is not 100% compliant and we're going to approve um, hypothetically, right, the request to adjust the zoning, but then these are the community benefits that come along with that. Um, and so I think it's, I do think it's a, um, it's a very promising um, development. Um, just looking at it, it is very uh, appeasing. I won't get into the, the materials that you're choosing, right? You know, this is just the sketch review initial. Uh, but I think there's a lot there um, that I would like. Um, and I would still, I want you to come back and help us understand um, the, the, where you're not compliant, um, um, how you can get into compliant or what the trade-offs are. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is more of a, a discussion, a question for us. Maybe it's not uh, council, not discussion tonight, obviously. Um, but this parking thing, right? So we have the guideline <laughs> for that. And I believe um, the US Bank, at the last council meeting, we had that conversation where we're recommending something that they don't agree with. Um, and so we've got the same thing here again. Um, and so the ask is, um, I think we need to understand where do we really need to, to land on the parking? Uh, when I look at the proposed versus the standard, um, and then just come to some agreement on how we're going to uh, um, address it or um, how we're going to get comfortable with um, allowing a difference there. So that's it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. One of the things that I really appreciate about the building is the effort you made to make this a four-sided building that every side is really in a way a front door which is odd because you're right on 169 <laughs> with part of the building a long run of the building and this is more curiosity than anything but i was wondering how you decided to put your amenity deck up in the northwest corner of the project which basically faces towards 169. It, it's a great question. It, we actually studied that and I sat in the parking lot for a while because we wanted that afternoon sun and we really wanted to study the a sun lot of, and light. A lot of iteration. A lot of iteration. So we knew that the pool deck and the sun was really important. We knew that our main entrance wants to engage that corner of Lincoln and Londonderry, but that would not have afternoon sun. So that was a, the biggest design challenge is do we separate these amenities or not? Um, and we decided to follow the sun and put it there and are pretty confident mm -hmm. that we can landscape and put a buffer in. Uh, but I think it also addressed, we wanted to really have active use along Londonderry and that also relates to some of the comments on setbacks where we wanted to engage that street similar to the Southdale setbacks of 35 feet um, and to try to, to do that along Londonderry. Um, so that's the, down, the delicate balance we've tried to play with. By actually setting back towards the street, we're getting more air and light in the middle of the building. That's it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, Director Teague, can you go to that compliance table? Because I got a clarifying question for you, or I need an answer. Um, so it says the city standard is MDD 6, but they would probably be going the PUD route. Is that a fair assumption? So when you said the city standard is uh, for MDD 6 is 50 feet on the front setback of both Lincoln and Londonderry and Highway 169. Is that true under the PUD ordinance as well? So with the PUD ordinance, we would be setting the standard as part of that ordinance. So uh, the PUD ordinance is not written until their proposal comes in. All so right. we would write the standard um, into the PUD ordinance. Specific so for this in site. the last conversation, you were talking to Member Jackson about a compliance table for PUD. So what? Well, there's the city standard, there's and then there's, I believe, what Council Member Jackson was talking about was some of the, those suggestions within the design experience guidelines. We could add a third column to have those suggestions, yeah. so it would be 
get city that. code Remember proposed that. Yep. design guidelines. But the PUD gives us much more flexibility. Right. And and so when you look at what's proposed there, it, there's 40 uh, feet with an asterisk, and that relates to the um, existing code. And then it says 53 feet. It's not in bold. So is that is 53 feet what they're proposing for a front yard setback on Lincoln? Or what, what are you proposing there? Yes, okay. there's a point that's 40 feet, and then there's a part of that building that's code compliant. Yep. And it, so okay. on Lincoln, we were, and then we're closer to that Southfield guideline, 35 feet along Londonderry. I believe it's 37 feet on Londonderry. Was it for Member Anderson and Member Pierce, was it Lincoln or Londonderry that caused you to think you wanted a little bit more setback? Um, I'm, I look at Lincoln and Londonderry. I, I think that a more concise plan on that site makes more sense to me. And if you go to the north side, you see then we're really pushing over there. If in fact there were continued residential development to the north, and this boulevard treatment through here, you have to create it if we decided to go that way. Mm -hmm. And we don't know if that's gonna be the case at this time. But I, I do, that's, that's what I'm, that's really what I'm suggesting. That's what I'm seeing there. No, I, I, I agree with that. I, um, I think because there's industrial to the north, the, Comments I was making about the other development, our, our, the other sketch plan, it's even more imperative that we do it here because this is the same. It's going to be setting the standard for that area. Um, and so when I was talking about setbacks, I was thinking, I thought London, Lincoln rather, was fine, um, was okay. Yep. Um, but I thought London Dairy or London Drive. What time? London Dairy. <laughs> London Dairy. <laughs> London Dairy. <laughs> and then um, to member Anderson's point, um, when you turn to the north off of Lincoln Drive, that boulevard now was going to go potentially all the way down to the cul-de-sac mm -hmm. where the industrial is. Mm -hmm. And so it's even more imperative that we think about the totality of that development as yeah. maybe it's multiple paths, but at least be thinking about it as though it's all going to get redeveloped. One unique piece of the site on, on this right hand side, there is a shared easement. Hold your microphone up, would oh, you please? Sorry, sorry. There, there is a shared easement on this right hand side of the site, so that drive lane would stay. So that's where the setback on the right hand side is a little deceptive because we have that drive lane easement. We're using that to access oh, okay. the parking garage. I see what you're saying. Yep, so that there, there's actually a separate road there that would be there. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I feel the same way as Member Pierce on uh, Lincoln Drive. I'm comfortable with that setback. And I like the idea that you've got that, what you call the common space or your kind of your entry. Uh, I, I like the idea that that's pronounced and people can see it easily from the street when they're driving by. And when you're coming uh, east to west, you really get a great view of it. And it seems real welcoming. So I, I, I'm okay with that setback. If we get, if you're going PUD, we've got that flexibility. What you do along 169, I, I'm really comfortable with. <laughs> Anything along 169 Frontage Road or uh, the entrance ramp is a really great improvement to whatever is there now. And, um, and I think the only question then is, uh, could you, can you do anything along Londonderry that um, creates a bit less feeling of it kind of hanging over? It feels to me like it's hanging over the sidewalk, you know, it's hanging over the street, and it's it's kind of yeah. right there when you walk by. So, I I leave that to your good minds. Um, the sewer capacity issue, I think that's that's uh, that balls in our court, really. If we expect to see some things happen over there over time, then we better try to figure that out. And I think uh, this is an impetus for us to start thinking about that as, and Director Milner's already thinking about it. Building height, I'm okay with that. Um, the parking, 
Member Pierce mentioned that again. I think that's something we'll just have to walk through, but I don't see that, at least at this stage, as any kind of an impediment. Um, but I guess, you, I guess you better know that early on yeah. because you've got to design <laughs> accordingly. So um, I know that from the design elements that you all used over on 77th, West 77th with the Solheim project over there. And it's nice to see progress over there, by the way. The demolition, it's really uh, uh, exciting to see that. Uh, as we go into winter, it'll be something to watch uh, <laughs> during the winter. Um, so back to this one, uh, I think you'll employ some of those same sorts of nuances that you guys are really good at uh, in creating a project that is really someplace that people want to see and people want to live. And you've got a, a real knack for that, a real aptitude for that, I think. Um, and I can hardly wait for people to see the Solheim project on West 77th when it's finished because that's another project that looks great from all four sides, but especially from the park side. Um, so I expect to see some of those same sort of uh, elements here. I think that's it for me. Uh, Thank you. We hope you'll come back, I think, is the general message you're getting here. And thanks for being in our community and wanting to do things in Edina. We like that. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. All right. Where is that agenda? There it is. Juneteenth, Manager Neal. A little discussion on potentially adopting Juneteenth. Yes, we had a brief discussion on this item at your November 16th council meeting, and I and I think the consensus was you would entertain the proposal to declare or to establish the holiday in Adina, and so I've constructed that recommendation for you, and it's on the table tonight. All right, I think you proposed, as I recall, three different uh, possibilities. I don't know if you want to walk through those or sure. not. Um, one is you can, <clears throat> you can establish, you can take action to establish the, the holiday uh, tonight. Uh, one, you could, you could uh, make the establishment contingent on whether or not the state is going to take a similar action. There's been a lot of indication that they, that they are, but they haven't done that yet. Uh, or the third option is just to not do, is to not do it. Um, so those are the three options as I see it for the council. So in your memo, uh, it says Juneteenth was established as a federal paid holiday for federal employees to act to President Biden in May 2021. And it looks like a period, but I think I think you meant commissioners in Hennepin and Ramsey County also approved it. Yes, they have as a holiday, paid holiday. Yes. So, but, but uh, most suburban communities. Um, haven't done anything yet. And what's been our historic practice with respect to um, uh, creating new official paid city holidays? Do we usually follow the state or do we, have we gone our, on our own path? We have only one, if I recall, um, Ms. Schaefer, I think we, have, we only have one, uh, what we would consider to be a non-mandatory holiday, I think, right? And that's the day after Thanksgiving? Uh, <clears throat> correct, actually the day after Thanksgiving and Christmas Eve and Christmas Eve. are the two non-mandatory. We do not, the state has one uh, voluntary holiday, which is Columbus Day, but we are open on Columbus Day. You got to change that day after Thanksgiving policy at the golf course so that the golf course pro shop is open on Black Friday, not closed. Anyway. It's an aside. That's a different issue. <laughs> That's a different issue. Uh, what about, uh, what are folks' thoughts on, on, on Juneteenth? Is, uh, you know, taking it on with the three examples we have here, going on our own pathway here as a suburban community and establishing it as an official city paid holiday for 2022, 
waiting until we see what happens at the state uh, or continue on as is? Anybody have thoughts? I mean, I think taking no action really isn't consistent with what we talked about. We talked about establishing it in some form or fashion. So I think it's either we go on our own path or we wait to see what the state does and follow along. It doesn't sound like there's any precedent here, really. I don't think so. Anybody have any thoughts? Member Jackson? I like the idea of being a leader and establishing that as a holiday tonight. Letting Edina lead like we have in other areas? Yes. As you pointed out tonight. On the <laughs> Other thoughts? Are folks comfortable with that notion of leading? Yeah, I am. And I think, um, you know, it's consistent. We spent a large part of the evening talking about our four pillars, one of which is better together and, um, you know, creating a welcoming and inclusive environment and recognizing this holiday in particular, I think, is a really important way to one important way to do that, so. Member Anderson, your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. I couldn't come up with a reason not to take action tonight. It, it just seems to me to be the thing that we should be doing. Maybe uh, maybe the state is gonna follow us this time. <laughs> yeah, well put. Member Pierce, any comment? Just thumbs up. All right, is there a motion to uh, Established Juneteenth as an official paid City of Edina holiday for calendar year 2022. So moved. Second. Got a motion by Member Staunton, second by Member Pierce to establish Juneteenth as an official paid city holiday in the City of Edina for calendar year 2022. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion as stated say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I don't think we probably had any correspondence come in. Uh, I don't have an aviation noise update. I something's uh, happening. Do you, Manager Neal, have anything? I do not, although they, we did receive a scheduling request from the, um, uh, from MAC on scheduling all the knock meetings for 2022, and we passed that on to uh, Mary Brindle. Okay, good. I noticed they announced today at the MAC that uh, Allegiant was going to start flying between mm. uh, Minneapolis and Nashville, I think. Mm. So the slow recovery continues out there. Uh, Mayor and Council comments, Member Jackson, you want to lead us off? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I really got to thinking about this um, area that's at London Dairy and Lincoln. It seems to me when we were doing um, work plans, I thought I had raised doing a small area plan for that. And I know Commissioner Miranda raised it. Um, I guess, you know, one of the things that we talked about with the Cahill area is the industrial use there. And, and I'd like to have a discussion at some point in time about what, how important industrial zoning is in our city because I, I'm, I, I, like I said, I was really excited about this project. I think it's a really good use of this piece of land. But to the north, it is all industrial. And, um, and it's a, that's part of our economy. And so I, I think to think about it being a balanced economy in our city, if things go from you know, one source to another, we want to keep that option. But it's a, and I, what I was told when I asked, and I don't remember who I asked now, but um, about doing a small area plan is it's a very small area. And, and we walked it again the other night and it's, it's a pretty small piece of land. Um, I don't see it becoming a 50th in France because it's just not that big. But you know, it, as change happens, we might want to think about some sort of guidelines um, of what we want for that area, considering the industrial use. And the other thing I learned, and I, and I mentioned that briefly, is that there's no bus service in that whole quadrant. Once you get outside the Grandview area, there is no met, metro bus service in the northwest quadrant of Edina. And I was shocked to find that out. I'm like, can this possibly be? And it's all shifted across the highway to Minnetonka. Um, so we have no bus stops. Uh, you can call 
and service will come, but there's no scheduled bus stop in the Northwest Quadrant outside of Grandview. And I, I thought that was really shocking. Um, and I don't know what we do about that, but I wanted to, to raise awareness of that. Are you thinking that a bus service would be good on a, a broad community basis or just to get to the light rail? You know, I don't know. I, I just, it was an observation. Um, yeah. And I don't know, I'm sure there's a reason that it was canceled. There used to be an express bus that left from that part of the world, went down Vernon and went straight up to downtown Minneapolis. Um, but I think perhaps the thinking is to drive people to the green line and some sort of connection would be nice. Um, but because right now you can only walk there, um, that last mile. Um, That's an interesting thought to uh, talk to the Met Council about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Metro Transit, about, especially when the light rail is up and running in 2023 or four, uh, that little little connector route out there with all that multifamily housing could be a nice little loop. Yes. That gets run by the B line or somebody else and just takes people to and from the light rail. Yeah. In that whole quadrant. Yeah, it would be nice. But I, I thought that was a really interesting. Um, I learned something new about transportation in Edina. Um, so. Uh, Manager Neal and I attended the Southwest Cable um, Commission meeting last week, and we talked about the renewal contract. Um, we gave our uh, executive director directions on, on negotiating that with Comcast. Um, it will mean some rate increases, um, and uh, but we set a range, and um, and I have a lot to learn about the Cable Commission. It's complicated stuff, but we did have that meeting um, and Edina was well represented, lots of staff people and um, it's interesting. Um, and then finally, the state has, the, the House of Representatives has issued its first go round on redistricting and they had a hearing last week. I, I watched it. Um, Manager Neal actually, when I left my budget meeting, he's like, did you see that? I'm like, no. And I went home and was able to watch the next day the, the hearing. Several cities commented on their um, the redistricting plan. Our, both of our uh, state representatives I talked to and they both said, well, this isn't going to be the final plan um, by any stretch of the imagination. But I, I wanted to tell people what's in it and then I responded to it because if this plan were to pass, it would be very bad for our city. Um, you know, Edina is roughly a, a rectangle uh, cut into quarters by 162. So in the plan put forth in the Minnesota House, it divides our city into three different House districts, which would then we would have two state senators. So starting at in the southwest quadrant, starting at um, Indian Hills and, and Braemar to the south and kind of a triangle, um, that would go into an Eden Prairie district represented by an Eden Prairie based state senator. And then the other two would be the middle part of Edina and then cutting out the whole Southdale area south of the hospital and putting that into a primarily Richfield district. So it trisects our city. Um, I thought it, for two reasons, so I, I pointed out, to, I sent a letter to the legislature, sent it to Representative Edelson who passed it on to the committee. Um, three things. One is that our current representation works well because the parts of West Bloomington, Minnetonka, and Eden Prairie that are represented in 49B are very similar interests to the 49A. So there's not a big difference in what those districts are asking for at the legislature. Um, under this, it really represents three different interests. So our two, the first issue I raised is that our, our regional parks are, would have difficult time getting representation. So with Braemar, um, golf arena and the hockey arena and the um, public works training center, those would all be under one representative, but the primary number of people who live and use Edina would be in a different district. And so looking at like our sale, and if you think about our sales tax ask for the local option sales tax, then on the east side, our biggest commercial district is in a different district. So if for something were to go wrong and we needed to go back to the legislature for the local option sales tax, do we contact the representative who con covers most of our commercial district 
Do we contact the representative who covers most of our people, or do we contact the representative who covers primarily a single family um, housing? Because the Braemar uh, facility is in that district. So it really cuts our, our interest in a strange way for um, bonding and for the local option sales tax. The second thing is um, by taking that Southdale is district out of um, the primary and sort of segregating it, that's where most of our um, multifamily housing is. And it's scattered to some extent throughout the city, but it's most dense there. And that would affect our housing policy at the legislature. So I, I wrote an email, sent it in um, on my own behalf, um, but I would love to have your support for those comments. And I do have them printed out. I, I didn't make copies, but if you guys would like to see it in writing, and I can give it to um, Ms. Allison if she wants it for the record. So. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for doing that. Yeah. So those are my comments. Lots going on. And uh, yay for the climate action plan. <laughs> Member Anderson. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to follow. I, um, there is a lot going on. I kind of felt, uh, when I look back at tonight, I think uh, we accomplished a lot here this evening. And I, I, it, it feels to me as if we have brought some things to a close and also opened up a couple of doors. Um, and I, I, that's, I, I feel a sense of, beginning to have a sense of completedness as we wind down 2021. It's kind of hard not to think about winding it down at this point. Um, I also uh, appreciate our police update to start the evening. And I, I don't, I, I wanna just uh, spend a moment recognizing the fact that there are many people in our community who are very concerned about safety, public safety and crime in our community. And, and I, I, one of the challenges that we're gonna face going forward is to be certain that uh, we are able to understand that law enforcement, inclusion and equity are not mutually exclusive. That's on the table for us. We, we, need to, uh, we need to give serious consideration to public safety, but not to the exclusion of others, or that that feels as if that's impacted, or that there are concerns on the part of anybody in our town about the fact that we do need to work on this. Um, I think as our neighborhoods <clears throat> and streets start to pull together, that we have the best chance of lessening opportunity for what I think are primarily crimes of convenience. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can be uh, very reassuring to the public in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. Member Sutton. I don't have anything to add other than to echo. I hear, hear, Member Anderson. And I guess I would say to Lieutenant White, the next time the chief asks you to take a meeting, just, you know, you might want to take a look at the agenda before you agree. <laughs> Member Pierce. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Member Anderson actually hit one of the points that, um, the only point actually that I wanted to talk about. Um, so from, uh, police, um, neighborhood safety. We, you know, we continue to hear concerns about that. Um, and I will send a note to Chief Milburn. Um, but one of the things I, I almost mentioned earlier in the meeting, um, there is a concern when we talk about law enforcement and inclusion, right? Um, this talk about having community watch programs, right? That sounds like a great idea. Um, however, there are many people in our community and uh, a few have reached out to me that um, are concerned about that. And the, the, the thinking of um, we've had, there are examples across the nation where that's been successful. 
but there also are examples across the nation where it's ended up with tragic results, um, with vigilante type um, behavior. Um, and it's, it's, it's very close to racial profiling. Um, and so that's some of the comments that I have received uh, from residents that are just um, a little nervous about that. Um, and so I think that as we continue to do the good work of ensuring that our communities are safe um, and we explore different ideas, it really is important to do that through the lens of diversity and inclusion. And I would, would add, we actually have done a good job at that in the, in the city. When you sit back and you, even tonight, right, when we think about some of the decisions we've made and the discussions that we've had, we are you know, better together using that lens of how is this, um, these decisions benefiting the broader community. Um, and so in this case, um, it is really important for us as we move forward that we ensure that we're doing that. Uh, because I, I, as I mentioned, I did have uh, a, a number of residents raise a concern and they're just, they're just nervous for their African-American sons, right? If they're walking the neighborhood, um, it's cold out, right? They're just concerned about it. Uh, and it's incumbent on us to ensure that all of our residents uh, feel safe. And I will say nothing has happened, right? Everybody is on board with helping um, address the issue. Um, it's, a, it's a good idea to be watchful. Uh, but, but we have to be careful about how we communicate it and how we uh, stand up those types of solutions. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks for those comments, uh, all of you. Um, the day after Thanksgiving, we had the uh, annual Christmas tree lighting down at 50th in France. Uh, they had to put it in a different place because Pete Dinovic and the group are busy remodeling the old Bellison's building, which is where the tree is usually located, but it's a beautiful tree uh, just to the west a little bit. I've never seen so many people down there for an opening. I think it, it speaks to the effort that uh, the, uh, Nolan Maine's owners uh, and the 50th and France Business Association have made to mm -hmm. really uh, engage the community and have all kinds of events down there uh, for people. And it was, it was really a, a joyous sort of time for people and kids and Kids like to come up and talk about what they're grateful for. And uh, we do that and then count down from 10 to zero and the Christmas tree lights go on and they're all excited about that. And then they go have some, now they could go have some hot chocolate around the corner in the pavilion there or in the, in the uh, square. Um, so that was a, that was a really uh, a wonderful event for Edina. Uh, let's see, then uh, last Tuesday, I, I had a call, for, or not a call, but an email from a person that I, work with on transportation things at the White House. And they said, well, you want to go to this Biden event on Tuesday, so we'd like to have you go out there because it was transportation related. So I was out there with the mayor of, uh, the host mayor from uh, Rosemount and then the, the big city mayors were there as well. And, um, and uh, so you get to have a lot of conversations as you're standing around waiting for somebody to show up three hours later after you, they've told you to be there at 1.30 and he comes in. Yeah. 4.30 or whatever, whatever it was, you know, so. Um, and so anyway, I had a lot of interesting conversation with folks uh, and we can talk more about those another time. Um, then I had a, I went down on Thursday to uh, Rochester. We had a Minnesota mayors together. So mayors came from greater Minnesota and from uh, some various suburbs in like Edina. And then also uh, Melvin Carter came down, which was great to have one of the big city mayors there. And the conversations there are the same conversations we have here, uh, uh, effects of the pandemic on small business, workforce shortages, uh, housing affordability, lack of daycare, um, crime, 
mental health is a big issue everywhere. Whether you got 250 people in your town or um, you know a couple hundred thousand like St. Paul, so a lot of commonality on the issues, a lot of good conversations around around those issues, and um, and then yesterday we had an MLC uh, conversation about uh, uh, the housing subgroup on the the strategies around housing first and uh, Steve Elkins' bill. And then we got a we got an MLC meeting tomorrow. We'll have a broader conversation with people uh, from the various communities involved in the MLC. Um, and then I had a U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting today at two. And uh, the president has appointed Mitch Landrew, who was the former mayor of New Orleans, to be a co-chair for the implementation of the infrastructure bill. So he was on the call, and we got to hear a little bit from him about what they were doing on a federal level and what he was encouraging us to do on a state level, which was to encourage our governors to do the same thing they're doing federally, and that is to appoint a task force of stakeholders that can talk about how to spend all this money that's coming to the state and doing it in a cohesive way so that there's continuity between state, county, and local governments on the use of these funds. So I sent a letter off or an uh, email off to the chief of staff for the governor suggesting that very thing. And uh, all kinds of interesting things continue for all of us. So that's my report. Manager Neal. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Just two quick things, and then I'll get to the item that I had included in the packet. Uh, one is that we have uh, secured our uh, state legislative delegation for our annual joint meeting, and that will be on Tuesday, January 4th, our first council meeting of the year. Our work session will be dedicated to the discussion that we have with our state legislators every year. Usually turns into a pretty good snow day. If you, if you look at our history behind that meeting. Uh, the other meeting is <clears throat> the Municipal Legislative Commission breakfast, annual legislative breakfast uh, for our area. It looks like, and I think Mr. Mr. Mayor, you got the same message. I think it looks like it's Thursday, January 27th. Is that? That's right. Um, that happens to be a Thursday. And, and we will be hosting that at Braemar. Um, and, and you're all invited. And you're all invited. Most, most years, we travel to Plymouth at the Creek Center. The Creek Center is under construction this year. So we are going to host it at Braemar for our kind of part of the world here. Uh, the item that was included on, on my agenda for tonight was an item related to the National League of Cities uh, annual Congressional Cities Conference. Uh, the comp last year's conference was canceled. Uh, if you'll recall, the previous year, uh, we were like the last thing that happened in D.C. before uh, <laughs> before the whole thing shut down for pandemic. Um, that was the last conference that, uh, that they had there. Uh, we have a tradition and a custom of going as a, as, a council, as, a, as a council to this conference. I think this year would be exceptionally important if, if the council can swing it to go. We've never had as much uh, fiscal connection and policy connection it's been many, many years since we've had this level of uh, kind of connection with the, with the feds, and including uh, just the, the money piece of it and the policy piece of it that we could really have some, some influence on if we, uh, if, we are attend that, if we are able to attend that conference. In order to attend that conference, it would be necessary to move uh, a, a scheduled city council meeting date. We can do that pretty easily by sliding it back from um, Tuesday the 15th to Tuesday the 22nd. What month? Of March. And so I wanted to bring that to your attention tonight because if we are of a mind to do that, uh, we ought to take that action at the next council meeting to formalize that so that we can change, so that our city clerk can change all of our calendars everywhere and get them right. That's it. Okay. All right. Member Sutton? I was just going to say that works for me. And it's a five Tuesday month, so yeah. you, you just shift in an extra week yeah. from the end to the front. Right. To shift to the 22nd would be right. okay yeah. for your So you schedule. still have two weeks after that before your yeah. first <laughs> April meeting. It actually works pretty well. All right, we'll give that some thought and we'll yep. talk about it next meeting. And um, anything further? 
Uh, no, other than we just need a quick HRA meeting immediately. Tom, we do, and we'll have to hold off until we're told that we can start that up. But um, is there a motion to adjourn the city council meeting for what started on, I guess it's still, we're still barely there. <laughs> December 7th, 2021. Motion to adjourn? So moved. Here. Member Jackson moves. Member Anderson Second. seconds. Second. Um, <laughs> any further discussion? All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. City Council stands adjourned. <laughs>